Oh my god. Okay. Okay. Well, this is funny. This is funny. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hello. Can, can you hear me? Am I here? I don't even know if I'm here. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. So this is funny, but not really. Um, I've been talking for the past 15 minutes to you guys. And as it turns out, you couldn't see me or hear me because I wasn't live on the YouTube thing. I was live on OBS. I was not live on it. So I've been, <laughs> I've been sitting here talking, spilling all this stuff, looking at the chat going, huh, nobody's actually talking to me. They're all talking amongst each other. That's, I mean, that's a good, it's, it's good that they're doing that, but one would think that they'd want to respond to something I was saying. And then I went, wait a minute, that big giant red button that says go live. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> okay. All right. That's funny. Well, I wonder what's going to happen then uh, when this goes to YouTube. Is it going to be like 15 minutes of blackness and just nothing until I pop up 15 minutes later? I guess we'll find out. Wow. Well, hello, everyone. Yeah, this is a major do-over. A major, major do-over. Wow. Okay. Well, hi. Thanks for joining me. Sorry about that. Sorry about the whole weirdness. I am no expert in streaming. Uh, I'm an old man and an old Luddite. And um, this, uh, <laughs> I do it so rarely, sometimes I forget to hit the button. So there you go. There we go. There we go. Anyway, hello, everybody. Uh, especially welcome to my channel members. I can see you all there with the uh, the little red D D20 be beside your names. And happy uh, 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 welcome, rather, to um, any patrons who are joining me as well. And uh, all subscribers, because that's the purpose of this particular chat, was to open up to all the subscribers, all 30,000 plus of you. And... Um, yeah, well, Lona's Cave says, put a time stamp on it. I will. I will check that when we're all done. Okay, so, so, now I have to remember what I said. <laughs> okay. Oy vey. Mm. All right. So, let's talk about season four. Let's talk about um, the show. Let's talk about what's going on. So. The first thing I want to say to you guys is um, uh, I was shaken today because um, my dear friend who uh, helps me out with animations, he did a bunch of animated stuff for the Blade Runner series uh, on the channel. If you guys haven't seen that, go check it out. It's, I'm hugely proud of it. It's a little eight-episode miniseries where we run through the... Um, the first episode or the first uh, um, mystery adventure thing that Free League released for, for Blade Runner. And we did it uh, live. Well, not live. We did it with three players and myself jamming, and it was fantastic. Fully produced. It's like a little TV show. Go check it out. But a friend of mine did some animation bits for that just to kind of help prop up the uh, uh, or bump up the production value. And he's doing stuff for season four. He's helping me do a little opening piece for season four. Those of you who know. Uh, what I do with the show, uh, with the seasons I like to do, um, I like to do a little opening movie. So this is what we're doing, and he's helping me out with that. Well, he went into the hospital today, uh, and uh, I don't know yet how serious it is, but it's not sounding good. Um, we're hoping it's not the worst, but... Um, it's really shaken me to the point where I wasn't even sure if I was going to be able to do the stream tonight because uh, it's very, very recent. I just got this news. And uh, so I'm trying to put that out of my head and just kind of focus on the positives and the good about the progress we've we've made so far. But it is kind of um, – I mean, he's one of my oldest friends in the world, and he's like a brother to me, and I've known him for – Everybody's done some incredible work, and the work he's doing for season four is just unbelievable. It's so cool. It's so cool. Um, so – uh, keep your fingers crossed that everything's going to be fine for him or for those of you who are of a religious bent, uh, you know, keep him in your prayers and such like that. Anyway, um, so that's that. I'm going to try and just, as I said, focus on the good and the positive and all that stuff. So, um, season four. <laughs> First of all, uh, I was hoping 
uh, that season four would be aired already, that we would have done the first episode. Uh, my original plan was to have it done, the first episode done by end of February, but that has been delayed. It's been delayed because of uh, music concerns. It's been delayed because of a, a few things. Um, nothing terrible other than the news we got today. Uh, and again, I'm hoping that that turns out okay. But uh, I'm currently, fingers crossed, providing everything goes okay with my, my friend, uh, hoping that I can shoot in the next two weeks. That's the hope. Um, now, when I shoot... I shoot and I do my post-production back-to-back. So when I go into the shooting room, the studio, I shoot, and then I immediately um, go into the post-production studio. I go into the edit suite, and there I stay for about 48 hours. So theoretically, once I shoot the show, um, uh, it'll be done within two days, and then I'll have it up on YouTube, and, and, and we can go from there. That's the hope. Um, the schedule, uh, it'd be great if I could do it once a week. Uh, that's my hope, but it might be once every two weeks or it might be a combination. It's not going to be once every three weeks because I do not believe in waiting too long between sessions. Even when I'm GMing a game, I'm very, I'm very fascist about that. It has to be once a week (laughs) or else forget it. So I'm going to try and keep that sort of, uh, uh, disciplined schedule for the show as well, but schedules and real life being what it is, of course. Uh, that is that. So, uh, yeah, the goal is, uh, have the first episode up in a couple of weeks and then once a week from that, I have said before as well that I'm trying to keep this season shorter, um, which I normally would never do because normally I just let the dice determine everything, but there's certain realities involved that, uh, don't really give me the luxury of doing a 25 episode, um, season. So, um, Probably I'm kind of aiming for like 10 to 12 episodes and then the season will be done. And and how I'm doing that is just basically keeping kind of the main through line very, very, very tightly focused. It's going to be about this. It's kind of like uh, using an iron sworn sweat up, uh, iron sworn sweat up, (laughs) an iron sworn setup in that, you know, an iron sworn how there's this basically super objective. There's like the big vow and everything you do is trying to, is trying to like, um, gun towards that big vow. That's kind of what I'm doing with this. Uh, there, there's, there's a, there's a big objective that the main character has to take care of and everything that character is going to be doing is going to be always, always, always moving towards that. So that should keep the show very streamlined. There shouldn't be a ton of side things that get in the way, but we'll see. (laughs) We'll see. Um, uh, in terms of the Oracle, the game system, all that stuff, and now I can't remember where, if I've already told you this or whether I told uh, the blackness of YouTube this. Um, so I'm just going to repeat it. And if I'm repeating myself to you, then I'm repeating myself to you. Um, the system itself, uh, a lot of people have said to me, oh, so it's going to be like a solo system, right? For solo gamers? No, it's not. What I am designing is a role-playing game that is designed for a GM and one or more players ostensibly to sit around a table, or a VTT, if you will, um, to play a game. And yes, I will be playing that game solo, like I did Savage Worlds, or like I did Dominion Worlds. The game is not specifically designed to be a solo game. It is designed to be a regular role-playing game that I will be playing solo. So the next question uh, becomes, is there going to be, like, am I providing my own Oracle system? right? Because I am playing it solo, even though it's not an actual solo game. Um, and the answer is no. <laughs> and the reason why I'm not providing an Oracle is because uh, I've never used Mythic Second Edition, Mythic GM Emulator. I've talked about it a lot, but I've never actually used it on the channel. And it's high time I did. And I'm excited about doing it. So I'm going to use Mythic for the channel. And um, honestly, uh, why would I try and uh, compete with perfection? Because as far as I'm concerned, that Mythic Emulator, for me, is pretty much as perfect as you can get in terms of, a, of an Oracle kind of product. So for me to come up with my own thing just because, eh, it's a waste of time. There's people out there who do it better than me, and why would I waste my time? So I, I will be using uh, my own system with Mythic to go through the season exactly as I have done before because it is a, a fantastic thing. Um, someone asked me what the name, uh, someone in the chat here asked me what the name of the game is. That's, um, that's a good question. 
<laughs> we've been struggling uh, over the name for some time now. Uh, the game itself is what we call OSS, Old School Simulation. It's Sim Light. So my predilection is not uh, my predilection as a, as a GM, I like I like games with a lot of detailed rules that remove the narrative burden from the GM. So, for example, instead of the orc swings and hits you for five hit points, it's the orc thrusts the spear at your left forearm and punctures it, causing you to drop your shield. And now you have a bleeding wound, right? Now, most of the time, those kind of simulation games are really complex and they take a lot of time to resolve at the table. That is not my goal. My goal is to create a game, which i kind of done, I think. Create a game that is sim light, so it retains the what I consider to be the flavorful details of something like a combat, but it keeps the pace up. So uh, hard... Core simulationists will look at this game and say, no, it's too rules light. Uh, rules light, people will look at this game and say, oh, it's way too many rules. <laughs> so basically, I'm not going to not gonna please anybody with this game, except for myself. But there you go. That was the point of it. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm not interested in chasing a trend. I'm not interested in, in re reproducing yet another version of D&D &D with an OSR game or anything like that. I'm interested in doing what I am interested in doing. And... Uh, I've played so many games over the 40 years I've been doing this and ran so many games that I wanted to sort of Franken system together. Uh, the ultimate game. And of course, it's not the ultimate game. No game is the ultimate game. There's no such thing as the perfect game. Everything, uh, like, like there's aspects of this game that I love that are taken from Harnmaster, for example, uh, as well as about 15 other games. But that doesn't mean I'd never want to play Harnmaster again because Harnmaster does things in a particular way that I love. My game won't. My game is kind of like the Sage's Library uh, greatest hits, right? So it's 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 cobbling together a bunch of different game systems that I like and making them all play together under one umbrella. That's the deal. So um, I like it. Uh, I've been working on it since the summer. Uh, it's undergone a lot of changes, and it will undergo more changes as I play test it through season four, which is also part of the point of season four. But um, I'm not going to tell you too much about it, but I will tell you, um, as I said, it's it's not OSR based. It is not rules light. Uh, as much as I value and respect those rules light games, uh, I get bored of them pretty quickly. Uh, if there's not enough meat on the bones of my mechanics, I get tired of it within a few sessions. So I knew I needed something a little more robust, but not so robust that I have to take an hour just to do one combat between two people. That's no fun. And it's no fun to watch either. I'd wind up cutting all that stuff out of the show. So what's the point, right? Uh, so my thing works pretty good. As I said, I've been testing it a lot and refining, 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 and I think it's pretty good. So what can I tell you about it? Uh, it is a D100 system. It uses percentile dice um, because that is the that is my... That's my dice of choice as well. It works really well with Mythic that way because Mythic uses percentiles and so will my game. Uh, my game differs from your classic D100 games like BRP or RuneQuest or anything like that in that it uses a little uh, fancy mechanic from, uh, well, not from necessarily, but as seen in Delta Green. So in Delta Green, it's a percentage system, You but you roll under, but you roll high. It's what they call a blackjack system. You want to roll under your skill but high. And a lot of things are opposed roles, which means that whoever rolls under and highest wins that particular contest. So the math is dead easy. Another design aspect I have for this game, or, or uh, sorry, a design um, intention I have for this game is to do as little math as possible. Simulation light, but as little math as possible. I know who knew. And also no charts or very, very, very few charts, which is another thing people go, really? How? Well, you'll see eventually. Um, but the idea is that it is a D100 game, roll under but roll high, and when you roll those dice, those two numbers on that dice tell you a lot. So you don't need to do a bunch of math because just looking at those numbers tells you a lot. Uh, so I'm very, very excited about that. Um, Gideon asks if there's no two-hit chart. Uh, there is, in fact, but it's on the character sheet, and it's really simple. There are hit locations, because I love hit locations, and there's peace armor, and I love peace armor. Um, there are no classes. There are no classes. This is a skill-based game, which means that anybody can sort of learn to do anything, although 
that's not quite as easy as it sounds. Uh, there are kind of profession packages to start off with, but it's not really a class. It's kind of like, uh, for those of you familiar with Dragonbane, Free League Dragonbane. When you play a character in Dragonbane, you have a starting profession, but it's just a, a starter set of skill packages to get you going. You can develop your character however you want, and that's the same with mine. I will tell you this as well about the game. It is predicated on what I call, excuse me, the four pillars. I believe that a good role-playing game has four different conflict arenas, four different arenas where players can sink their teeth into and really have interesting things happen. And those four pillars, those four conflict arenas, are this. Combat, obviously. Gotta have a cool combat system or else you don't have a fantasy role-playing game. Let's face it. The magic system. The magic system I'm super proud of. It's the magic system I've wanted to use my whole life, and I finally put it together, and I think it works pretty cool. People who've play-tested it love it. Uh, the social encounter system, which is another thing I've used for years and years and years, and it's awesome. And then the exploration system. So these four things all have the same mechanic, but they utilize the mechanic in slightly different ways to give people a different experience of the game. I like to tell people that if you are playing a straight-up warrior in this game, you are going to have a very different experience of this game than you would if you're playing a spell weaver someone who is casting spells, than you would if you were a follower of a god, than you would if you were an ex explorer character, than you would if you were someone who was like a diplomat or someone who was really, really uh, trying to find another way to get around a, a, a situation without resorting to violence. All of these are viable options. And in the social conflict arena and in the exploration arena, it's all about players making meaningful choices and having the tools to have a very tactical experience. That's right, a tactical experience in a social conflict situation or a social encounter situation. So I want people who love the idea of talking their way out of a situation or, or negotiating a deal with the king or whatever, whatever, whatever social situation where there's things at stake. I want people to have the tools or the characters to have the tools to be able to not only achieve their goals, but to do it in a very interesting and risky way because the game is all about risk reward. The game is all about taking chances. The game is all about pursuing your stakes. It's about pursuing that which is important to the character. That's the only way you get experience in the game. You don't get it by looting treasure. You don't get it by killing monsters. You get it by pursuing your character's goals. That's how you do it. So that tells you something about the nature of the game. It is not a story game. But it is about the characters, okay? So there's lots of stuff going on here. Uh, you would see easily the DNA of 15 different role-playing games in the, in the core rules document. You would go, oh, if you knew about games, you would go, oh, that's that reminds me of Delta Green. Oh, that reminds me of Hardmaster. Oh, that reminds me of Warhammer Fantasy. Oh, that reminds me of Fate. Oh, that re all these things. They're little pieces in there, and they're all kind of living together under this one roof that still does not have a name. <laughs> so, um, currently, the working name is The Broken Empires because that's the name of the world, although I'm probably going to change that. I know I said that in the Lichdom episode. I said that the Broken Empire is the name of the world, but I think I'm going to change that for a reason I'll get to in a second. But currently, it's called the Broken Empire's Sim Light Role Playing in the World of Me, Myself, and I, I think, or something like that. Um, but it might not be called that. I have another, I have another name, name in mind that uh, I'm testing on people, and uh, people are digging it, and I dig it. But I'm, I don't know. Naming's hard, man. Naming's hard. It's hard. I've come up with so many perfect names and we can use none of them uh, because either they have an association with something else or another game system or another game is called that already. You wouldn't believe how many indie RPGs out there have already claimed the best <laughs> names for games. Drives me nuts. But hey, kudos to them. They got there first. What are you going to do? Um, Names are very, very difficult. Yes. <laughs> Names are different. You guys have a lot of questions here. I'm going to try and get to them, um, but uh, uh, I, I, want, I want to get through this stuff first. Tell you all of the stuff I want to tell you about. So yeah, that's that's kind of a quick little overview of the game. It's personal based. It's simulation light. It is uh, very, very, very detailed in its in its approach in terms of the characters have many tools with which to approach a situation. There's To use the vulgar phrase, there's many ways to skin a cat. Just because you encounter a potential combat situation does not mean that that is the only way out. There is many ways to deal with it. 
The magic system, as I said, is my favorite thing of all. I love it, love it, love it. It is inspired by several different games uh, and resembles a lot of them, but also none of them at the same time. Uh, the players who have played it uh, really, really like it. I will say this too, and I will say this th as a feature, not a bug. This game is not for casual gamers. This game is not for someone who just, you know, had a hard day at work and they want to come and roll some dice and explore some dungeons with their friends using simple rules. All the power to you, man. And there's about a billion games out there that'll do that way better than mine will because my game demands more from the players. It demands more for the players and it also demands more from the GM. It, it is a kind of game that, and again, I, I'm not saying this in, with any degree of superiority. I'm not saying mine is better at all. I'm just saying that the focus of this game and the design intention of this game is to allow the players and kind of give them the tools and the and the opportunity and the permission to really inhabit their characters in this world so that they can uh, engage with the system and engage with with the emerging world in a way that I, I don't want to say it demands system mastery because that's not exactly true. You don't have to. It's not like Pathfinder, right? Like with Pathfinder, especially once you get into the higher levels, if you don't have system mastery, you're going to be lost among all of the superpowers you have. And, and, and to a lesser extent, even 5e does that. Or maybe not a lesser extent. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, while you can tailor your character in many, many ways, and there are many ways to make your character exactly what you want it doesn't require that kind of system mastery what it requires is characters to um or players rather players to really invest and inhabit their characters around the table um i don't know i, I don't know how to describe it better than that right now i'm still working on the the the, the introduction bits so <laughs> uh if it ever you know if anyone ever actually reads it so that is what I can tell you about the game. Um, so, uh, what I can tell you about Season 4 in general, I think I've already told you. Uh, basically, I'm not going to tell you who the main character is or where it's set or anything like that, but I will tell you that we're... Uh, hopefully, you'll find out in two weeks. Uh, that's the goal. Okay, so let's let's go to the phones and see who we've got here. All right, I'm going to go. I'm going to scroll way up here and see what I missed because I'm sure there's a lot. Okay. All right. Uh, lots. Of th thank you so much for uh, the sympathies about my uh, friend in the hospital. That means a great deal. Uh, okay. Yeah. Mythic. Mythic's good. Why wouldn't I use it? It's great. Uh, do, 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 do. Well, Under's Cave, one of my channel members, says uh, Woofrup, which is Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, takes so much time to resolve. Yeah, it does. Um, I haven't played 4th edition, but I have it, and I've read it. Um, and I was inspired by certain aspects of it, actually. Uh, but I don't like it. I don't like it because I think that they tried to fix things that didn't need fixing. And I think that they overcomplicated things that didn't need to be overcomplicated. But of course, that is purely subjective. Because there's people out there that love it, and people are going to say the same thing about my game when they see it in action in Season 4. They're going to be like, why did he overcomplicate that? So what are you going to do? But it does take too much time to resolve, and that bugs me. I like detail. I don't like it taking forever to resolve. And that is a very, very, very fine line. It's a hard line to find. Uh, okay. Uh, would like to see some variation of the zeitgeist. Yeah, man, that, that's, that's a big deal to me. Nothing against the OSR creators out there. I'm big fans of theirs. And uh, you know, like, like Kelsey Dion, who did Shadow Dark, she is one of the best people I know. She's just the best. And uh, she made a really cool little game. Um, but it's not my style again. No, I shouldn't say that. I, I do enjoy those games. I just wouldn't want to run it for like an extended period myself because it's, it's not what I tend to dig, right? But there's so many people that love those games and there's a reason for that. As Baron Drop told me, you know, in our, in our chat that we did, he said, you know, one of the things about the OSR is that you can use everybody else's adventures with very minimal, uh, um, you know, conversion. And I went, Oh, I never thought of that. <laughs> so that's really valuable. So I totally get it why people do this. It's just not my jam. I'm, I'm, I'm something else. So if I can introduce a game that is a little more simulation and does demand a little bit more from the players, that's going to narrow my market. That's going to narrow the, the amount of people who are interested in my game or interested in seeing the game. And uh, okay, that's the way it is. I figure that there's people out there who want this and their voices are, have just not been heard. I'll see if I'm right. <laughs> I'll see if I'm right. Okay. 
Uh, Terry Priest asks, will it be usable for different settings? Uh, yeah, uh, my game is very, very clearly a fantasy role-playing game, but there's nothing stopping you from picking it up and putting it in a different world at all. You can pick it up and put it in the Forgotten Realms, you can pick it up and put it in Harn, you can do anything you want. Because the thing I really believe in, too, is being able to dial up and down the, the options, kind of GURPS like that way, in that you can make a very detailed, deadly version of this game, or you can dial it back and make it slightly more heroic, right? You can dial up the power of magic, or you can dial it back. You can dial up the the overpower of gods, or you can dial it way back. It's all there, and the system won't break if you do it. So, yeah, you can use it any uh, system. Oh, somebody left me a little tip here. And, uh, oh, a bunch of folks did. I better say thank you for that. Who is this? Willonis Gay. Okay, well, thank you. Thank oh, thank you very much to your channel and your friend. Thank you very much. And Rain Dance Bushcraft. Uh, just wanted to say that I'm using Mythic and Savage Worlds right now. My first game and dice in like 35 years. Well, welcome to uh, welcome to the club or w welcome back. <laughs> welcome back to the table, my friend. And thank you very much. Very generous. Okay. Um, Gideon Rosen, which uh, would you say are the biggest influences in your system? I don't have time to list them. Like I said, this game is uh, the best of the Sages Library, so you will find pieces of so many games. You'll find pieces of RuneQuest, you'll find pieces of Pendragon, of Warhammer, of uh, Blades in the Dark. You'll, you'll find pieces of all these games in there. Um, yeah. Uh, 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 uh. All right. Where are we here? Where are we? Lots of stuff. Uh, <laughs> Lieberg says, no, I wanted to flip through hundreds of PDF pages for five minutes looking for the right table. <laughs> Sorry, sorry to disappoint you. Um, there will be some tables. You can have some tables, but the, 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 especially the combat system, the combat system is not predicated upon it. You don't need a bunch of tables. Basically, you need a hit location table, and as I said, it's on your character sheet. It's right there. Um, magic, those who use magic will want to have the... I don't want to call them tables, but I guess technically they are. Uh, they'll want to have that information uh, in front of them, uh, but once they get it, once they figure out how it works, they the, that'll be in, that'll become internalized very quickly to the spell weaver, so they won't need to be constantly referencing things. Uh, I love DCC, for example. I love the magic system in DCC. It's hilarious and it's awesome and it's deadly and it's crazy and it's gonzo. Uh, but it's one of those it's one of those magic systems where every spell has its own two. I think it's a two page spread in the rule book. Uh, which I think is awesome, but it also is time consuming. So if you're casting a magic missile, you got to look through the book and make your roll and then compare it to a chart and see what happens. And and I think that the detail you get from that is well worth the time investment. The the roti, the return on time investment, I think is super worth it there. But not, some people might not. Some people might go, no, 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 no. I don't want to flip through a book for anything like that. And that's that's their that's their choice. That's their taste. And there's uh, nothing wrong with that. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, Vidal Pagan, looking forward to your game. It was great to meet you at Gen Con 23. Well, good to meet you too. I, I don't have a picture of you, so I don't remember who you are, but <laughs> thank you for, for saying hello. I will be back at Gen Con this year, actually. I will be there uh, doing some crazy fun stuff, so if you guys are going to be at Gen Con, uh, come and see me. I'm going to be walking around, but I will be hanging out with the Columbia Games guys. Um, some. I'll be at the Columbia Games booth uh, some uh, doing doing some some stuff with them, too, uh, just because I love to promote Harn. I think Harn's great. Uh, so if you guys are going to be at Gen Con 24, uh, come and talk to me. And I'm going to do like a a seminar or something like that, or maybe like a maybe a demo of the game system or something at Gen Con. I haven't quite figured it out. I better figure it out because I only got a few days left to, to get it in the program. So uh, I'm going to do something. So if you're going to be there, check it out and and come say hello. Um, uh, Wingus Ryu, new to channel, been going through everything you have made. Well, thank you for that. Made me start solo. Never thought about playing solo. Never a thing I considered about when I first started playing in the 80s. Hooked now. Yeah, well, me too. I never considered it either until I did it as a joke when I started the channel. And it uh, turns out that uh, there's a lot of people that, that are doing it. So uh, lucky timing on uh, my part. All right. Um, 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 Dan Webb says, I'm sagely nodding and stroking my beard while hearing you describe this. Well, good, good. I'm glad. I'm glad I have your sage-like approval. <laughs> uh, Shut up and take my money, says Gideon. It's funny. Uh, Never Fear 1911 channel member just bought Mythic GM E2. I think you'll like it. I I think it's great. Uh, never actually used it, though. Again, uh, season four is going to be the first time I use it, so we'll see, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to like it. I dig. I dig. Tony L. So if you're playing solo, how will your character handle the different skill needs? Or will you be running several characters? Oh, I see what you're saying. 
Or will you be running several characters with different strengths? So it's not a class-based system. So there's no such thing as niche protection in the game. So a character has whatever skills they have. And they st when you start a character, when you build a character, it's assumed you come from a particular cultural background, which gives you certain skills. And it's assumed that you come with a profession that you have been doing up to this point, which gives you another package of skills. But from that point on, you're free to develop your, your character any way you want. So yes, there are things that you would need that you know probably one person isn't going to be enough if that one person is going to go off by themselves and tromp across the forests of the world and then get in big fights and then cast all kinds of magic and then go petition the king first yeah probably that one person isn't going to be able to do it all but as you've seen in my show if you watch my show npcs show up thanks to uh, the depredations of the mythic emulator. So I have no doubt that there will be new characters that, that join uh, the protagonist. But yeah, I will be starting with... Uh, technically, there's two, actually. There's two, two protagonists to start. Um, but um, we'll see how they do. We'll see how they do. They're going to have to play to their strengths, is the answer to your question. Right? And, uh, and, and see how it goes. All right, all right, all right. I'm not necessarily interested in a new rubric. I'm a Trevor playing anything fan. Well, thank you, Teresa. <laughs> uh, X Kilter Silva. If you are if your RPG system goes well, do you plan on making a Foundry VTT version for it? Uh, I won't, because I don't know anything about that. But if at some point people want to see the game and they they like it or something and they want to see it on Foundry, I'm sure there's a way to make that happen. Um, uh, I have a love-hate uh, relationship with VTTs. I recognize their usefulness and their growing usefulness in this society we live in where most people are digitally connected as opposed to uh, physically connected. But I will always be uh, a proponent and an advocate of, of playing with people physically around a table. Um, that, again, I, I recognize the necessity and, and utility of VTTs. But right now, it's not my primary thing. My primary thing is to make sure the engine runs, make sure the game works, and then I'll see about doing that. Um, you know, you know, you know. All right, where are we here? <clears throat> um, oh, thank you, Paul, for the little tip there. Hope your friend gets better. Thank you. Um, I hit a button and now I'm lost again. Where are we here? Uh, getting, oh, the, the, the BL, uh, BWT says getting burning wheel vibes. Um, burning wheel was an inspiration, but only a little bit. Um, I say that because burning wheel, I find the flaw with burning wheel is that it tries to mechanize everything. And I think that's too much, but again, that's subjective. That's just me. So yeah, burning wheel is one of those things that did influence the game for sure, because it's got a lot of great stuff in it. Uh, but don't go. Don't go too far down the burning wheel road when you think about my game because it's not really uh, not really there. Um, yes, it's definitely fantasy slash medieval. Um, uh, I mean, you could use the engine, I guess, to to do like sci-fi stuff or whatever. But right now, that's not a thing. <laughs> right now, it's just a a fantasy thing. Uh, Matthew Willis, season four will be one character or a party of characters. Uh, one kind of two. Uh, you'll see. All right. Um, 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 yes, two weeks is the ETA for season four. That's what we're hoping. We're hoping, but we shall see. Uh, I talked about the dice system. It's a D100 system. Uh, will your system, Jan Amiolan says, I'm butchering your name. Uh, will your system be able to deal with lots of opponents easily? About the same way that any fighter in a kind of quasi-realistic situation would be able to deal with lots of opponents easily. So no. Uh, System-wise, yes. Um, Smarts-wise, to be outnumbered is a very bad idea in this game. The way the mechanics work, um, just like in life. It's just like in life. All of us out there getting in sword fights every day. It's uh, very difficult to fight more than one armed opponent. And so too is it in this game. Now, there are ways to do it, and there's ways to plan for it, and there's ways to mitigate it, and there's ways to have special things you can do. But typically speaking, do not get outnumbered in this. Uh, you know, the, the the smart thing to do in this game is a smart thing to do in a lot of OSR games. Uh, try not to take any damage. Try to cheat and lie and bite and kick and use every trick in the book in order to put your enemy down before they know you're in the room. 
a fair fight is a stupid fight because that is just asking to be hurt. And if you're a smart fighter, you're going to end the fight before the enemy can even have the opportunity to do damage to you. However, those beautiful situations are so rare to come by in the uh, reality of the game session. Uh, nonetheless, that would be that would be the strategy: is try not to get hit. <laughs> <laughs> that said, to answer Drew's question, how deadly is the game? It is not, in fact, that deadly. Much like people think of when they think of the game Mithras, which is essentially RuneQuest 6. They look at that and go, oh my god, it's so deadly. Or they look at Harnmash and they go, oh my god, it's so deadly. But that's not really true. Um, those games, much like my game, are designed to end fights fast. But ending a fight does not necessarily mean killing your opponent. There are many ways to skin a cat, and there are many ways to win a combat. And you do not need to kill someone to win the combat, to defeat your opponent. Uh, there are wounds that can happen. There is stamina that can run out. There is surrenders that could happen. There is, there is getting an advantageous tactical on, on, on someone and putting your sword to their neck and compelling their surrender. There's, there's all kinds of things that can happen in order to end the fight within one round sometimes. Couple rounds, typical. Uh, what we found so far is that most combats are, are about two to three rounds and then it's over one way or the other. Uh, so not deadly, but fast resolving, and there are definite consequences for combat, uh, which I like, which I like. All right. <clears throat> uh, where are we here? Are you going to try grappling this season? <laughs> well, there's rules for it, and they're pretty simple, actually. Um, so I hope so. I certainly hope so. Certainly, certainly. Uh, kind of like GURPS, no. No, uh, there's aspects that are like GURPS because there's aspects like a lot of games, but GURPS, the core mechanic, is of course 3D6 and you add those numbers together and you roll under a target number and that's what you want to do. My game is, of course, percentiles, D100s, uh, so quite different in feel. And yes, I know the people out there say, you know, the D100 is just a swing as D20, right? Yeah, but they're different. They feel different. Uh, the granularity of a D100 is, well, five times more than a d20. You can do a lot more with a set of percentile dice than you can with a d20. You can make those dice tell you much more than you can uh, with a d20. Uh, and it just feels different. Anyone who's played games for any amount of time knows that rolling d uh, d20 is a very different experience than rolling d100, even if the math technically is the same. It's a different feel. And I'm a big proponent of, of doing things that feel right. That old six cents thing. Six cents. Um, Matthew Willis. Yeah, I've gotten into OSR games just because as much as I love complex games, I needed something light and focused on the player's characters rather than rules, but the ability to mess with the rules. Yeah, and I totally hear you. And I think there's huge value in that. Um, uh, that's why I don't tend to gravitate towards games like Pathfinder or even D&D because &D, there's just too much stuff going on that I don't really see the value in. I understand why it's there and I understand how it works in the system. I just... I, I don't dig. I don't dig. But again, it's all um, subjective. Uh, all right. All right. All right. DCC spells. Oh, I just lost my place again. Where are we here? D uh, Magnificent Devil. Hello. Welcome. Welcome to the chat. Channel member. DCC spells all fit on one page. You can make a spellbook prop to cast from... Oh, it's just one page. Okay, I thought it was a spread. But nonetheless, it's still cool stuff. Ian Pittock, how did the elements of what worked best for you in the systems you used for each season inform your own system? That's a good question. Uh, I'm probably more influenced by Dominion Rules, which was Season 3, than I am by Savage Worlds, which was Season 1. Um, I am influenced a little bit by Iron Sworn. But yeah, weirdly, I think season Savage Worlds is probably the game that influences mine the least, which is interesting now that I say that out loud, because it just occurred to me in answering your question. Uh, not that I have anything against Savage Worlds. I love Savage Worlds. I think it's super fun. Uh, but weirdly, I can't see a lot of things I borrowed from maybe Chase Rules. Chase Rules are kind of inspired by Savage Worlds. Savage Worlds keeps changing its Chase Rules every time they do a new edition, but I think they're always interesting. Uh, I'm not sure what their Chase Rules look like in the, in the latest version, but um, yeah, never fear. Who would you be interviewing at Gen Con this time? I, I don't know yet. We'll find out. 
<laughs> we'll find out. Uh, oh, I do want to say as well, you can see the little thing going across the screen here, guys. If you've not signed up for the free newsletter, please do. It's a huge way to help the channel, and uh, it's a good way to get sort of the latest news on stuff so that um, if you miss like a live stream or, or an announcement on Patreon or whatever the case is, you can get it in that in that newsletter. I do not sub I, I do not send it out very often. I only send it out when there's something to say, uh, but I like to put stuff in there, kind of special behind-the-scenes stuff that only newsletter people are going to see, and I'm trying to do more of that as well. But it's it's a huge help to the channel if if you guys do sign up. So uh, me myself and I dot com slash newsletter. I think it's right there on the screen right there. So if, yeah, if you haven't signed up, please go now. Drop everything and go into a different browser window. Window <laughs> and sign up for that uh, newsletter. Uh, okay, okay. Do you have any plans on releasing some early build of your system for the purpose of helping the playtesting process? Haven't decided yet. Uh, we'll see how it goes in season four. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, Conan laughs at your puny need for a party, says Doc Flamingo. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Here we go. The amazing Axor. I have to print out all my PDFs or buy physical books for all my things. Nothing like the tactical vibes of the hobby. Couldn't agree more. I'm a tactile guy. I need to to have a thing in my hands. PDFs are hugely useful, but for me, if I don't have a book, I'm paralyzed. I need to flip through that book and know exactly where something, well, I do know where something is, and it's way easier for me to find a page in a book than it is to, to try and find it in an electronic tablet thing. Yeah. But again, I get its utility. Um, have you already shot episode one? No. We're hoping to do so in the next two weeks. There's been delays. It was supposed to be out at the end of February. I said this at the beginning of the stream, but uh, uh, it was supposed to be out of the beginning of February, but there's lots of delays for various reasons. Um, will you ever finish Dragon Bane, my favorite solo game to play now? Yeah, it's fun. It's super fun. Uh, I doubt it, and I'll tell you why. I was playing the included solo adventure, which I think uh, Sean Tompkin uh, of Ironsworn fame wrote, uh, or, or co-wrote, maybe. Uh, and it's funny, he wrote me a, a message about the last... Um, uh, session I did. As it turns out, I kind of, I kind of screwed up a little bit. Not really. I, I did something that wasn't really intended to do until the next adventure, but it doesn't really matter. The point is, is that that whole adventure is really just a way to explore uh, the solo rules of things. Like there's not much of a narrative to it. It's, it's more just do the thing, get through the place and get the spear and, and there you go. And then move on to whatever you want to do. So I looked at that and I thought, well, I've given two solid episodes to Dragon Bait, and I didn't hit all the cool rules. Like, I didn't even hit the monster rules, because the monsters have their own set of rules, which I didn't even get to. Uh, but I did I did explore it in a way that I think a lot of people dug. I mean, that first video got 45,000 views, which for my little channel, that's a huge deal. So there was big interest in it, and of course, uh, not so much in the second one. That dropped way off, as is typical. People don't have any sticking power. They watch one thing, and then they go away, uh, never come back. So... Uh, I would love to finish Dragon Bane, but it's not on the priority list right now because I've got my own thing to do, but super fun, super fun game. Uh, okay. 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 Yeah. <laughs> uh, ex Kilter Silva, nobody close to me plays, uh, role-playing games. I only ever played online. Even if I played in person, I would think I would use a VTT because of the convenience of automation. Yes, I understand everything you're saying. Uh, I, for myself, disagree with everything you're saying. <laughs> but I totally get it, man. Um, if you've never played, if you've only ever played online, I can tell you you're having a very different experience than if you play in person. Not a better one, not a worse one, but a different one. And I encourage you, if you ever do get the chance to play in person, grab it, take it, because it's going to be different. And you may like it, you may not, but it all started around the table, my friend. And that is the, that's the old school experience of being in the same room with the players rolling physical dice doing that. And there's nothing like it. A VTT comes real close, but it's not the same thing. And honestly, for me, automation, I think, is way overrated. Because for me, that's, uh, that's the computer playing the game for me. That's my opinion. Just because I want to know how a system works. I want to engage with the system myself. I want to know what the dice mean when I pick them up and roll them. Not hit a button and then have a chat box tell me what just happened. To me, that's like, uh, I think I'll go play Skyrim instead, you know? 
But that's me, man. That's just me. Uh, I totally understand not having people around you to play, and if that's your only option. Uh, and it just if you dig it, if you really dig it, I got friends who love VTTs. They love Foundry, and that's great. That's awesome. I play with them. I play on Foundry all the time, so I get it. It's just not my preference. Uh, will you consider having a license or open license for third-party creators? I don't know. It depends if I release the game or not. And if so, I'd, I'd have to... I have to think about that. How does progression work in the game? I spoke to this before. Uh, it's entirely, at this point, it's entirely about pursuing your character's goals. And I think that's probably where you guys might get the idea it's like burning, burning wheel, right? The idea that you only advance as a character by pursuing your goals. I have said a million times in other videos that a game is made up of the players taking action and pursuing their goals, pursuing what they want, and the GM throwing obstacles in their way to make them fight for it and work for it. They push on the world, and the world pushes back. That is drama. That is gaming. That is any game, basically. The characters want something. That could be something as simple as we want to go in the dungeon and see what's there. But they want that. And so when they do that, the world, the dungeon, responds to them in some way. That's the game. So characters want things. And as long as they are actively pursuing those goals, they're going to advance. And there's very specific mathematical ways of the advance. Very simple, but it does exist in the game system right now. Um, and my definition of pursuing goals means you have to challenge yourself and you have to roll dice in order to overcome an obstacle. You know, you can't challenge yourself by saying, well, my goal is to eat dinner tonight. Oh, I ate dinner tonight. Didn't have to roll anything. I guess I get experience. No. <laughs> it has to be something that requires you to to uh, overcome an obstacle for. So that's how you uh, progress in the game. How much playtesting have I already done? Asks Neverfear1911. Quite a bit. Just to get the core engine humming. Started this in the summer, way back, and have been working on it every day, every waking hour since. Uh, holding all kinds of playtests with um, people I know. And... Um, very, very smart gamers who really understand the ins and outs of rules. A lot of engineers. Uh, so that's been uh, really, really valuable. Uh, but I'm not trying to play test too much before I bring it to the table for the season four. Because, again, as I've said, part of the thing about season four is it's going to be part play test, right? All right. All right. Where are we here? Oh, and I just hit a button again, and now I've lost my... <laughs> It's again. Claudio Monteverde. Is the combat system grid-based like GURPS or Theater of the Mind? Yes. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Der Car Carasquillo. Uh, Carasquillo, I'm going to butcher your name. That's what I do. Uh, I really like this idea of sim light and hadn't thought of it before. Thank you. That's something that we might patent. <laughs> <laughs> or we have patented. I don't know. Uh, it's, it was just a term I came up with that I don't think I've seen before. Maybe I have. Might have been out there. It's just simulation light. Um, and that's all it means. And it, it provides um, just a different flavor to, to games than an OSR situation would or a D&D. This is not a super powered fantasy game that I'm making at all. It's not competing with 5e. Believe me. It's a very catering to a very different taste and a very different audience. Although I would love 5e players who are maybe frustrated with their own experiences in 5e to have a look at it and go, oh, let's try something totally different just to see if we like it. I'm always trying to get the 5e guys over to new games. That's what the Sages Library is all about. I want players to know their options, right? Because a lot of them don't. And I don't care if they take the options. I don't care if they actually play the games. I just want them to know that they're there. So that at some point, if they say, you know what? I got a hankering to play X. Some, Why don't we just do it in D&D? &D? Yeah, you could. Or you could actually go to the game system that's specifically designed to do that. I just want them to know that that stuff's there. I really, really, really believe in that passionately. Hence, the Sage's Library. Okay. Chopsticks. Hey, Trevor. First time I've been able to catch a live... Stream. Great. Welcome. Thanks for joining me. Uh, there's quite a few of you here today, which uh, I'm eternally impressed by and surprised. Um, okay. 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 Dallas says, wait, kind of two protagonists. Carlos and Brain Sorcerer Guy? I shall never speak. Zip. You'll have to wait and see. All right. Uh, where are we? 
Where are we? Can your system... Oh, this is x again. Can your system be used on a modern fantasy setting like Earth with Guns and Magic? Probably. It wouldn't be hard. It wouldn't be hard to... I don't think it'd be hard, anyway. Uh, <clears throat> Never Fear says, The appeal of OSR for me is how quickly you can make a character as opposed to something like D&D 5e. Yeah. Um, my system of making characters is not that easy. I shouldn't say it's not that easy. It's it's not that quick as an OSR game. You can't whip it up in five minutes, but you can do it in 15. Um, I'm trying to test a system right now that makes it even less than that right now. So we'll see. Um, I like the idea of being uh, of having fast character generation, but also because the focus of the game is is on the characters you're playing, I want to give a little more robustness. You're not really intended to drop dead from the first goblin arrow you take, although it could happen. But there are rules in the game that are mitigated to just give the player characters a little leg up. And normally I hate that in a game. Normally as a player, I want to be exactly like everybody else. I don't believe in mooks. I don't believe in minions. I think that everybody with a naked blade is as is a threat. But we're playing a game here. And if you're going to take the time to play a character, you want to have just a little leg up. <laughs> so you do in my game. Just a little leg up. All right. Caitlin Joe, like the live stream. Well, I like that you're here watching the live stream. Um, Terry Priest says, I play mostly Savage Worlds after seeing it on a certain someone's YouTube channel for season one. Hmm, who could that be? Well... Thank you. That was super fun to do season one. I love Savage Worlds, and I love the story of Simon, and I love, I love all my children, all the children I birth in my brain. Uh, <laughs> uh, Never Fear says rewatching season one. We'll probably watch the other two as well. Please do, not just because the algorithm needs to be fed, <laughs> but also because I think they're really good. I'm so proud of the seasons in the show. So proud of everything I've done on the, on the channel. Very very happy with it. Okay. Uh, though the amazing X, uh, Xor says that 30,000 mug design is amazing. Thank you. You bought one, obviously. It's my secondary teacup just after my Shadow Dark mug. Uh, what he's talking about is, um, uh, the mug that I released for my 30,000 subscribers. It's on sale at the store right now, me, myself, and die.com slash store. We make all of the merchandise completely by hand. We don't farm anything out. All the designs are made here. Well, I have a friend actually in Ottawa, Canada, who who designs the actual designs for me. But we do everything, all the production here. Everything is handmade. There's no mass-produced anything. So when you buy a mug, you're getting it handmade, pressed right here. So if you want to check that out. Um, oh, that's the other thing. If you sub subscribe to the newsletter, there's a there's a new subscriber little uh, uh, discount you get right at the bottom of the newsletter if you want to buy something at the store. So. Uh, that's how we try and keep the channel alive, too, is by selling this stuff, because we like it. We think it's pretty high-quality stuff. Uh, okay. Nick G has a very good question. Combat-wise, how realistic sim are you... Where are we? Stop that. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Nick, combat-wise, how realistic slash sim are you trying to go? Example, will a longsword have a tough time going against plate armor? That is an excellent question. When you're designing a simulation game, which I'm not, I'm designing a sim light game, so the flavor of simulation without all of the realism, but when you're designing a game like that, you always have a fine line to walk. And that line is, at what point do I sacrifice, quote unquote, realism for playability? And that line is going to differ for everybody, right? For those people out there who loved Phoenix Command... Yeah, we're my Phoenix Command players. <laughs> uh, they're going to hate something that doesn't specifically tell you all these details about how the hit came in. For rules light people, they're going to hate the fact that there's too many details. It's a, it's, a, it's a real, real fine line. For me, and I have to design this game for me, I think I found a line that I really like. I found a line that gives the flavor of detailed simulationist kind of effects without... Uh, without going, without pandering too much to reality, right? Yeah, a longsword is never going to cut through a plate breastplate. But there's abstraction. And at that point you go, okay. The abstraction is at some point the plate, the, that sword is going to be able to damage the guy wearing that plate. So how does it work? Is it because it caught in between the, you know, the little chinks in the armor there? Or it doesn't matter. The, the point is, did it work? 
So that's where you abstract, right? And again, that's fine line. Some people are going to like to abstract things on that side of the line, and some people are going to like to abstract things on the other side. You just got to make a judgment call, and I did. So you'll see how that works. And uh, people are going to love it, and people are going to hate it, and that's just the way it is. Okay. All right. Dan Webb says it's all about conflict makes a story. Correct. Without conflict, you have no story. You have no narrative. You have nothing happening without conflict. That is the driver of all drama since we fell out of the trees. <laughs> since humans crawled out of the caves. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, yes, yes. No, uh, X Kilter Silva, I know what you mean when you say uh, playing online is my only option. I wish I could play in person because then I could do expressions and stuff. By automation, I mean tracking arrows and annoying resources. Uh, I know. Yeah, and you're right. That's super useful. I, I, I Believe me, man. I get it. <laughs> I get it. I'm not criticizing your, your uh, situation at all. I totally get it. All right. Uh, Lord Melkayar. That's what my players need to listen to. If they don't engage with the world and its challenges, the game will not progress. The players need to take the first steps. Amen, brother. Preach. Preach, Lord. Preach, Lord Melkayar. Yes, I agree completely. However, it is incumbent upon the GM to help them do that in my opinion. Uh, a lot of players are paralyzed when you put them in a situation where they are not given the quest. Now, I haven't played with those kind of people in a long time, but there's a ton of them out there. And <clears throat> th there's nothing wrong with that. It just means you have to tailor your GMing style a little bit to try and accommodate the players you have, right? And so, if I had a bunch of players that were terrified of taking a first step because they're so used to waiting for the old man in the corner of the tavern to give them the quest... I would start by giving them the quest, but I would slowly kind of teach them a different way to do it over the course of a few sessions. And then at some point you start to see the light bulbs come on when they go, oh, wait a minute. You mean if we act on our own agency, we can actually make something happen that the GM doesn't lead us to? And that's the moment, that's where you have the birth of the true gamer right there. That's where you have the moment where RPGs are at their most powerful, where you have the players understanding that their agency, as expressed through the mechanics of the system, uh, creates a unique experience that you only get in the game. Wow, that sounded so highbrow. <laughs> uh, Goldbeard Blacktooth says this game sounds really cool. Well, I hope it is. Um, we'll see. <laughs> uh, Overkill Joe says dice rolling is risk reward. Yes, exactly. That's why we roll the dice. I like to say, like, I, I like to, to to phrase it like this. I believe that the dice represent in in a in a combat situation well not not just in a combat situation but i like to believe that the dice that you roll in a conflict we'll say they represent the chaos of the universe all the little things that you can't account for that are all working against you or for you right because the dice can work in your favor just as quickly as they can work against you the dice are chaos pure they're pure chaos and they are the they're the whims of chance. They're the whims of things that you have no control over. That's what the dice are, and that's why we roll them. That's why someone with a 90% skill can still fail the roll, because some aspect of the world in that moment decided, no. And that's why we roll the dice, because it creates unexpected situations. If everything was planned beforehand, we wouldn't have a role-playing game. We'd have a story. And we're not looking to create, or we're not looking to pre-impose story on the game. We're looking to have a story emerge from the mechanics of the game and from the interactions of the players and the GM. Wow, super highbrow today. Wow. <laughs> Captain Scarecrow says, will your game have a quest-creating system? There's going to be, I hope, again, if I ever actually release this, there's going to be a, a very thorough GM section that not only tells you how to GM this game, but also tells you how to GM in the style that I think uh, this game benefits most by. And so a quest creating system is, is a lot of random ideas to generate random. You're not going to find a lot of that in my game. And I'll tell you why. Because so many other people have done it better than I have. So I would much rather say to someone, hey, you want to play my game solo? That's awesome. Go buy Mythic. Because Mythic is going to tell you how to do it. That I would rather do that than try and give some half-baked oracle system or a bunch of random tables in there. Hey, you want to know a bunch of random tables for what's in a treasure chest? Sure, I'm going to spend a bunch of pages in my book doing that when Matt Davids has already done that in his incredible series of resources that you can buy on Drive Through RPG through the links below. <laughs> the book of random tables. 
That's that's what he does. So why would I compete with that when he's so much better at it than I am? So uh, those kind of things will probably not make it into my game if it ever gets released. Uh, but uh, because there's no need for it because other people have done it better. All right, all right. Whiskey Whiskers, it's a vortex. Such a huge investment for D&D that they think everything else will take the same amount of time and hard cash. Oh, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. People, and I think probably especially GMs, because it tends to be the GM that spends the most money on these things, not the players, although that's not always true, but tends to be the GM that makes a financial commitment to the game. They think, well, if I've already spent 500 bucks on all this stuff specifically for D&D, I can't. I don't want to just abandon that. Yeah, I get it. I get it. I totally get it. And then there's the sunk cost fallacy. So, <laughs> uh, but I get it. I totally get it. That makes sense. Um, I have a hankering to play the play driver quest. Driver quest. <laughs> Another vote here for calling the system four pillars. Well, maybe. It's a bit on the nose, isn't it? It's a bit on the nose. <laughs> the broken pillars. Yes, all good. Uh, Never Fear says, 15 minutes to create a character is an improvement over spending an hour. Right. Well, I, I'm going to try and get a less, but yes, I will <laughs> accept that. Okay. Uh, Joshua Baines, B Benes, Benes, I'm pronouncing it wrong. Of course. Do you think you'll cover Nave 2E in the Sages Library? I'm currently waiting on getting the physical book from the Kickstarter. Uh, I only cover games that I've actually played or run in the Sages Library. Um so will I do a review of it? I guess if Ben sends me one, I'll definitely do it. Uh, he's a great guy and he makes great stuff. Uh, and I'm always, always, always open to to reviewing stuff like that. But a, particularly a Sage's Library, probably not. Because again, that's just for stuff that I, I feel I know something. Because, you know, it's one thing to review a game if you've just read it. But it's a very different thing to review a game that you actually have played because they're very different things. Just reading a game does not give you the ins and outs. It does not give you, I feel it doesn't give you <clears throat> the kind of detail you need to make a real solid assessment of how the game actually plays. You need to play it, right? And I know you can't do that, right? Like Dave Thalmavor is, is a great guy and a great reviewer. His channel is all about reviewing games. Dave can't play every game he reviews. He doesn't have the time. No one has that kind of time. So he, he does his best to give you a really thorough, thorough idea of what is in that book, right? He does a fantastic job. If you haven't subscribed to Dave Thalmavor, do so because he is great, which reminds me, I do want to do a little ad for my friend Baron Durop here. He's doing a convention coming up and you guys should know about it. So take it away, Baron. You see goblins trying to sneak up on you through the bushes in the darkness, but they don't seem to realize you've detected them. What would you like to do? Wait a minute, who am I even game mastering for? That's where you come in. I need you to join me for Green Dragon Fest at Ancient Lore Village in Knoxville, Tennessee from May 16th to the 18th. And it's not just me who will be running games. Play in sessions game mastered by some of your favorite YouTubers and game designers at a venue that looks like it's right out of a fantasy novel. You'll be able to play with Bob World Builder, Josiah from Dungeon Dad, Shadow Dark's author Kelsey Dion, Runehammer's Brandish Gilhelm, Justin Alexander from The Alexandrian, DM Scotty, Ted from Nerd Immersion, and more. Admission includes meals, drinks, game sessions, and while the rooms last, you can upgrade to stay at one of the fantasy-themed suites right here at the Village. This exclusive event is only available for 70 guests, so get your tickets while you still can at the link in the description or at greendragonfest.com. See you in May, Dragon Raiders. Tell me you heard that. <laughs> I've never put an ad in a stream before. I don't know if it worked. <laughs> Tell me, because that will be very embarrassing if you didn't see it. <laughs> Somebody tell me. Somebody tell me. You saw it. <laughs> okay, good. Good, good, good. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Look at me all fancy with my ads. <laughs> okay. All right, let's get back to some questions here uh, and comments and such. Uh, Third Duck 21, will any characters be... Re Let me try that in English. Will any characters be returning? Uh, yes. All right. Um, <laughs> Keldon, with the game system, how do you deal with attacks? Standard rounds. Does everyone get a fixed number of attacks? Do they, do, do they increase? All of that will be made apparent to you when you watch the uh, 
I don't know about the first episode, because I don't know if there's going to be a fight in the first episode, but certainly there will be a fight at some point. Gotta test it. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to say anything about that. I will say that um, it is combat is done a little differently than a lot of games. Um, it's not unique by any stretch of the imagination. I, I didn't set out to reinvent the wheel here. But the combination of things creates sort of a new experience. For example, there is no actual initiative in the game. That's a big one. And that, what? But how do you keep track of what's going on? Well, there's a way, and it seems to work pretty cool. I could be wrong. We'll see. Maybe by episode three, I'll be like, this sucks! Everybody roll an E20 and add your agility! <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> All right. The Broken Pillars. Yeah, that's that's a neat name. Uh, of course, that also implies that my game is broken, so that's no good. <laughs> Thomas Rowney, a big fan of luck points. Dominion and Mithras both have that mechanic, absolutely, and they have it for a very, very good reason, especially Mithras. I'm playing a Mithras game right now, and I've run RuneQuest in the past. Those luck points are, are real important, um, and I have a mechanic very similar to that in the game. Again, little leg up for the players, little leg up. Goldbeard says, uh, I never would have known about all the other awesome systems out there if I hadn't started watching your channel. That is a huge compliment. Thank you, my friend, because that is exactly what I'm trying to achieve. I'm re That's why I did Savage Worlds in Season 1. because I, I could have done D&D, &D, and if I was smart, I would have done D&D. &D. I would have done 5e. I would have jumped on that critical role bandwagon. But I didn't because I'm not a huge fan of 5e, and it's a fine game, whatever. It's just not my thing. And I wanted to show people something else, something different. And that is the same with my system I'm doing for Season 4. I want to show you guys something different. If you haven't seen anything like this before, maybe it'll be interesting to you. And it'll open your eyes. And you'll be like, wait a minute. Oh, I didn't know that you could do this kind of thing in a game. Or maybe those of you who are old hat at this will be going, oh, yeah, I recognize that mechanic. <sighs> yeah, that's out of a 1983 British game called blah, 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 blah. Who knows? But I really do want to... Uh, uh, Open your eyes to a, a whole new world. <laughs> All right. All right. Doug Bolton says, I remember the first time playing 3rd edition D&D. &D. My poor wizard took exactly one hit from an orc and dropped. Time well spent making that character. Yeah, well, that's first level characters in D&D. &D. That's going to happen. <laughs> Dearest Neck says, please bring back the magical bugs from season one. Are you talking about the giant centipedes in episode three? I hope you are. I hope you are. Well, they're in the world now, pal, so they might show up. You never... Never know. Um, <clears throat> we have any merch at Gen Con? Asks Bill Duggan. Uh, I don't know. Maybe. Um, I'll probably just bring like pamphlets or little flyers with like discounts on it because I'm coming in on a plane and I don't want to have to drag a bunch of stuff with me. So I might have some. I might have some shirts or something, but I'm not going to bring like mugs or anything. Um, we'll see. Uh, Caitlin Joe. Caitlin Joe. Is there anything you're excited about with how Mythic GM2 will interact with your game? Yeah, everything. I can't wait to try the new subsystems in there. It's going to be awesome. Daniel Hall, welcome. Welcome to the enthusiast, Daniel. Welcome to the channel membership. So great to have you on board. Uh, Bill N says, I have 30,000 and here's the thing. Oh, you got the two mugs. <laughs> That's cool. In my game room, holding our map pens. Well, that works too. You don't have to use it for liquids. You can use it for anything you want. Uh, oh, never fear. You forgot to use the affiliate link when you bought Mythic GM, too. Oh, what? How am I going to get that fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a penny now? My God, I'm going to starve. <laughs> but, but next time. <laughs> next time. <laughs> okay. Tre uh, Trez Tresmillion. Would you say that your game leans more to story or fighting and more balanced? For example, some games uh, seem to be more how fast you can get to the next battle. Okay, so I have talked about this earlier in the stream, but I will mention it again because it's very important. My game is all about <clears throat> empowering the players to find many different ways to skin a particular cat. So fighting is very detailed, but it is not the only option for you in most cases. Uh, magic is very, very detailed and super awesome, super cool, but risky. Risky to use, but incredibly powerful and versatile. Social encounters. You treat a social encounter in my game as tactically as you would a physical fight. There are, there are so many tools to be able to get exactly what you want out of someone without having to pull a blade on them, unless you have to pull a blade on them. But no, 
To answer your question, my game is not about getting to the next fight. It is not a dungeon crawl. If you use my system to dungeon crawl, the whole party would be dead after the, uh, the first 150 feet of the dungeon, I'm sure. So n- better games to use for that. So my game is not about that. My game is about characters pursuing their goals, using the skill set that they have, and using the resources that they have in order to get what they want and to push against the world that is constantly pushing back against them. Hit the like button, people, says Brad S. Absolutely, I concur. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe. Sign up for the newsletter if you haven't done so already. Huge way to support the channel. Costs you exactly nothing. Dearest Nex asks, Trevor, can you tell us how magic can be obtained in your system? Blood, books, etc. Yeah, good question. Um, <clears throat> awesome answer that I'm not going to go into too much detail about. Uh, basically, uh, if you play what I call a spell weaver, and there's a very particular reason why they're called spell weavers, um... You, you, if you start off as a spell weaver, you have an advantage because it's like you've been trained in that, okay? So you can do things. But in order to learn to do other things or to get, well, not so much to get better at the things you can, always, you can already do, but to learn to do other things, well within your power. But yeah, <clears throat> it, it's contingent upon the spell weavers to go out and find ways to do that. Sometimes that's grimoires of ancient lore that they study. Sometimes it's nefarious pacts with otherworldly creatures. Sometimes it's stumbling across a raw piece of of solidified magic, if you will, that's in the world that allows you to learn something. So there's all different kinds of things going on in there. Morta, 1337. Welcome. You're late, but that's okay. Channel member Morta, 1337. Why? <clears throat> Okay. All right. Well, Xkilter Silva says, man, am I looking forward to the system now because of the stream? Well, the, great. Then I guess <clears throat> I'm doing my job, which is awesome. And the stream is not a total, total waste of time, <laughs> which is nice. All right. Where are we? All right. All right. Claudio Monteverde. It sounds like your system is right up my alley. I've dipped my toes in tabletop role playing making and realize how hard it actually is. It makes sense that one calls it an engine. Yeah, yeah, it's tough, man. And the thing is, you know, it's very humbling because I have played games and run games, as I said, all my life, over 40 years. But to sit down and create a game system, even though it's cobbled together out of pre-existing parts, that is very difficult. And we make a lot of assumptions as game designers that are very often wrong. And you don't know they're wrong until you sit down at the table and those dice hit the table and you realize oh, I'm completely off about this. Playtesting is absolutely crucial. Absolutely crucial. Uh, Brad, I grew up on MMORPGs, so I'm one of those people who needs a prompt, like a quest prompt. You can move past that, Brad. I will show you. Show me the way. (laughs) This man is spitting fire! Yeah. Will in his cave says, can't wait to try this game solo. Definitely. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> I will in a couple of weeks. Stay tuned. <laughs> uh, Paul C., any hints of Shadow Dark in the rules? You know, I don't know because I don't actually have a copy of Shadow Dark. Nope, I lie. I have a digital copy that Kelsey sent me. I just don't have a solid copy. Um, so I don't know. Maybe. I'd hate to think I was stealing her ideas without attributing them. Um, <laughs> I'll have to ask her. And again, another plug for Kelsey and Shadow Dark. She is the best kind of people. She is just, she has been so supportive and so helpful for, uh, to me uh, with this project. Since the day I met her, she's been nothing but generous with her time and her knowledge and is just uh, someone I want to game with. And uh, I'm going to game with her, definitely. I'm going to game with her and I'm going to game with Ben Milton and Dave Thalmavor and Professor Dungeon Master and Baron Durop. We're going to get all the team together. We're going to do something cool. Damn it. That's what we're going to do. Maybe a Gen Con. We'll see. Maybe we'll play my game at Gen Con. That might be interesting. If I get a session together and I shoot it, it'd be very primitive because I won't have my, all my gear. But if I shoot it or even just record as a podcast, maybe like an audio podcast, maybe that's something you guys would be interested. Let me know. If I, if I wrangle those YouTubers together and run them through a session of my own game system, whoo, might be something. Let me know. All right. All right. Winds of Chance, says Dyrus Nex. That's the name of your system, Winds of Chance. I think there was a... <clears throat> oh, no, there was a supplement for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 2nd Edition called Winds of Chaos, which was a, which was a um, extension of the magic system. Um, not Winds of Chance. Winds of Chaos is what I'm thinking of. Cybram 1 says, Index Card RPG Master Edition is great random tables. Yeah, I have that too. 
Good stuff. So many people have done so much great work providing random tables and stuff. Again, why would I bother to compete? Because so many people have done it so much better than me. Oh, look at this. Daniel Hall has gifted five memberships to people. Look at that. Look at that. So this month, at least, my membership will go up, and it'll immediately go down as people go, What's this? I didn't set it for this. God, unsubscribe. <laughs> but I appreciate it anyway, Daniel. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thomas Ranney. Blades of the Iron Throne is a cool way of handling initiative. Very narrative. And I love the ability to steal initiative based on attribute opposed rules. Yeah, that's neat. That's a neat system. It's not mine. <laughs> I, did, I did not take that one. Uh, I might use something slightly different. Um, <clears throat> where are we here? Yeah, lots of members here. And again, welcome to the new members and welcome to new patrons as well. Your support keeps the channel going, and I'm not just saying that. That is absolutely uh, true. Brad S. says, Spellweaver reminds me of Shadow and Bone or Wheel of Time. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, I was influenced by, by Robert Jordan, for sure. Uh, I read his stuff way back when it first came out. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of influences. You're going to see, there's going to be like Dragonlance influence. There's going to be, this stuff. it's a whole lifetime's worth of gaming that's all going into this thing, right? So again, that's why it's never, it's not going to be wholly, you're not going to look at this and go, oh my God, we've never seen anything like this. No, you've, you've all seen something like this. That's the whole point of the game. It's, it's going to be familiar. Parts of it are going to be familiar to everybody. <laughs> all right. All right. Chloe, History and Game says, I love your show. Thank you. I love that you love the show, and I love that you're here. All right. Never Fear says, looks like you get 3 to 8% from the affiliate program on Drive Through RPG, so the content creator really gets nothing. Why even bother? Lol. Unless a lot of people caught a lot of returns, nothing. I don't know anything about it. I just know that I think they approached me early on and said, hey, you know, if you want to be an affiliate, I went, okay, I didn't even know what that meant. What it means for me is I basically can buy a lot of indie RPG stuff on drive through RPG <clears throat> and it doesn't cost me anything. That's what it means for me. Uh, it's not like it's a big money maker or something, <laughs> but I appreciate it. I appreciate anything, any little kickback I get from doing this. Cause God knows there's no salary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chloe again, that season one, was it Simon and his dad? That scene, I literally cried. Yes, it was. That was one of my favorite episodes where Simon has to deal with his father. And of course, those of you have pointed out, and you're absolutely right, that Simon's father being a ghost and not being able to remember things was very much <clears throat> a uh, an analogy of Alzheimer's disease. I lost my own father to uh, Alzheimer's disease, so that I think was probably more personal than I intended to give in the show. But yeah, that was um, that was a real thing. Yeah, it was one of my favorites as well. Never fear, one of my favorites. Whiskey Whiskers, how much would you say faction play is a part of the system? Are there mechanics for factions to take meta actions? Um, not yet, but that's definitely something I'm interested in. Um, <clears throat> I love Kevin Crawford's work. I love his worlds without number stars, without a number stuff. I love his meta faction thing. I love his rules. I love all that stuff. Uh, Justin Alexander in his book... Uh, so you want to be a GM, which I recommend as required reading for anybody who's trying to be a GM, by the way. Uh, he talks about a faction system. His is a lot simpler than what uh, Kevin Crawford's is, but it's just as valuable. So uh, yeah, I'd love to include something like that. Right now, it's not an immediate focus, but you know, maybe down the road, certainly, because it's, it's really good stuff. And it gives the GM so many more options when you have all these factions at play. I really love that stuff. Ooh, I get giddy. <laughs> Patrick Johnson, the only D100 base system that I played has been Gary Gygax's Dangerous Journeys. If you checked it out, I played Dangerous Journeys way back in the day, in the late 80s, early 90s, I think it was. Yeah, I played it. Um, that's the only D100 base system, huh? Well, welcome to a new world, my friend, because there are so many of them out there. Okay, Brad S. Oh, I lost you. Where did we go? <clears throat> Where did we go? Oh, I think I just answered your question. Okay. All right. Daniel Hall. Simon was good, but I think Arn was my favorite of the trio. Season three, though, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, it's hard for me. It's hard for me to decide who I like the best. It, it's tough. They're all so different to me, those seasons. They all have such a different feel. And season four as well will have a completely different feel. That's what I'm going for. <clears throat> all right. All right. Oh, yeah. So now you guys are responding to the fact about me wanting to run the YouTubers through my game. So we should probably do that. 
Oh, do do do. Arn is my favorite too. Big character development, I guess, from a repulsive bounty hunter to a man who ran from his oath, returned to his homeland to fulfill that oath against odds, risking his life. Yeah, he turned out to be quite a hero. Very, very pleased. Ninety-one, folks. Ninety-one. Those of us who know, know. <laughs> Doug Bolden and Nick G, welcome, welcome to the channel memberships, and welcome to the chat. Went through a lot in season two, physically and mentally. Yes, Arn sure did. <laughs> <laughs> he got the hell beat out of him. Love it. I love putting my characters through hell. <clears throat> I had somebody, some troll came on and, and tried to <laughs> claim that I was basically just cheating. I was basically, oh, he was in the Dragon Bane episode. Some troll came on and basically said, clearly you're just, you know, you're giving him uh, all the easiest possible. Why not just say what happens? Because clearly you're not playing the game. And I laughed and I said, you know, I, I don't think you know who you're talking to. Because if I'm known for anything, it's for putting my characters through the worst kind of hell imaginable and saying, all right, pal, let's see if you can survive this one. And they do, somehow. <laughs> oh, the trolls are so funny, aren't they? I like to laugh at them. Ha ha, I say. Ha ha ha. Uh, Magnificent Devil, channel member. Look at the factions in Crawford's Godbound. It's a simplified version of really good. Okay, I will. I will check that out. <clears throat> um, 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 um. Timothy Gavin, as you grow, I expect that any money you do get is being reinvested into the channel. Are you able to do this full-time, or does your career allow you the flexibility to create content? So I can't do it full-time. I'm a professional voice actor, and I still work in Hollywood all the time, <clears throat> and I from home. <laughs> and... Um, and I, I can't afford to not do that because uh, while, yeah, while the, the proceeds I get from various uh, revenue streams for the channel, um, it, that certainly helps. But most of the time it goes back into the, the channel. Like I, I completely re-tooled uh, my whole um, setup. So now I, I replaced all the cameras with 4K cameras. I've got all kinds of great new rigs and lights and things and I've completely cha been able to ch change out my studio, so now it's no—it's not a bunch of messy like uh, uh, tripods and sandbags ever now. Now everything hangs off of three C stands. Every light, every camera—it's great. I just love it. And again, couldn't have done any of that without the support of the channel. So yeah, the vast majority of the stuff that I, that I get from any kind of revenue stream from the channel goes right back into producing stuff for the channel. All right, <clears throat> where are we here? Okay, do 91. Yeah, lots of talk in 91. I really like Lee Adams. Uh, Lee Adamson says, I really like the way Beyond the Wall handles threat packs, factions. I will check that out. I think I have Beyond the Wall. Was I sent it? I can't remember. I get sent so many things now, I do forget. And everybody sends me their games. And I do not have time to look at all of them. <clears throat> and that breaks my heart because I want to. Oh, man. I have been promising Martin Knight. <laughs> who did the D100 dungeon game for probably two years now that I'm going to run his game. And I, I haven't been able to do it. And I feel so terrible. And I keep writing him going, sorry, man, I'm just, I got, and he's like, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Don't worry about it. But I'm like, man, it's been so long. I feel just awful about that. So I have to get to D100 because it's a very, very popular solo game. And I think people would love to see it in action. So, and that's part of what I do, is I demonstrate those games. So I, I got to. Martin, if you're listening, my apologies. Mea culpa, my friend. I'm doing my best to get to it. Uh, you've put so much work into that, and you've sent me literally everything you've ever made. So uh, <laughs> it's taking up a lot of room on my shelf. i got to make sure I use it. All right. All right. Bill N. says, Arn is my favorite, too, because I started with Season 2. I found me, myself, and I looking for Iron Sworn content. A lot of people came to the channel because of that, and... Uh, I'm glad that you found it, and I'm glad I did Iron Sworn. Excuse me, because I think I found a lot of viewers because of that. Um, I had the immense pleasure of talking to Sean, the creator, right before the season, where he helped me stat Arn, which was fantastic. Uh, you can watch that actually. It's one of my. It's it's a it's in my supplemental videos playlists, which you can see on the channel here if you, you check it out. <clears throat> it's um, I think it's called Talking with the Iron Sworn Creator or something. But yeah, it's great because we talk about the game, the design, and then we together turn Arn from a Savage Worlds character into an Iron Sworn character. So <laughs> it was great. Super cool. 
All right. Um, any news on finding a social media person? I know you talked about it in a previous chat. Um, no, no news. But also, I haven't been able to really look. Uh, I've been so swamped with getting uh, season four prepped. I haven't had a, a chance. Um, but I have to. I have to because I know it'll help. Uh, and I know at some point I have to get some advertising done because it'll help. But I just I haven't been able to. I'm so focused on producing stuff for the channel. Ricardo. <clears throat> oh, hold on a sec. There's one here I want to answer. Timothy, do you put the players you DM for through as much hell? Where are we here? I lost you. Uh, do you put the players you DM for as much hell as you do yourself in solo games? Oh, you better believe it, baby. I have a reputation among my my friends, not as being a killer GM, but of being a hard-ass GM. My games uh, tend to be terrifying <laughs> for my players because they never know what's coming and they there's a lot at stake and it's exhausting for them when we ran the one ring i ran a one ring first edition campaign for six years 30 years in game time it took us six years of real time to play that campaign one of the greatest things i've ever done and every every session we walked out of all of us me as the gm every them as the players we walked away from that just utterly drained because they were so tense all the time. So when the moments of levity happened, they were amazing. But it, it was exhausting. And yeah, I, I've had a reputation for being like, oh boy, trans not again, not a killer GM. I'm not out to get to kill the characters. I want the characters to succeed, but I'm not gonna just give it to them. <laughs> so yes, I do. I put them through hell and I love it. Ricardo, Trevor, how far are you? How far are you from going full-time on YouTube? Oh, we're a long way from that, my friend. Give me about another 100,000 subscribers and we'll talk. <clears throat> but, yeah, long way. Long way. Bill N says, I want you to keep voice acting. I couldn't imagine never ditching Boots for Bianchi in Starfield. Oh, yes, I was in Starfield. I never played it, so I can't speak to And I don't remember it because we recorded it so long ago. I don't know who I played. <laughs> Uh, Claudio, season two is my favorite. Your Hollywood experience clearly shows Hero's Journey, wink, wink, and the system complements it very well. Well, yeah, that's true. I mean, I do know how to, quote, unquote, craft a story. However, Iron Sworn is great at that because Iron Sworn gives you the structure necessary to uh, keep your focus, to keep your, your, your sort of narrative focus. You know, the super objective, the big vow, the thing your character's always driving towards. I think that's probably... Probably the most valuable thing I took out of Iron Sworn, and there's a lot of gold in Iron Sworn. But that one, if I had to pick one thing that I think is the best thing that Sean introduced, was that that idea, <clears throat> that idea of the overarching vow, because it completely focuses your character. Always drive towards that thing. So easy to play when you know what you're supposed to do, right? If you're a player, you need to know what your character wants. If you don't know what your character wants, you're hopeless. You're lost. You're waiting for the old man in the tavern to give you the quest. But if you do know. Then, then you know what you need to do. And what you need to do is take that next step towards it. Right? Love it. I think it's brilliant. All right. <clears throat> Where are we? Oh, I got a little tip from Nick. From what Canuck to another, eh? Thanks for all you've done so far for RPGers, especially for us solo enthusiasts. Super excited for the new system, too. All the best for your friend, Trevo. Thank you so much, Nick. I really appreciate that. And uh, thanks for that. Well, that. That fake money, eh? Jeez, Canadian money. You know I live stateside now, right? <laughs> Thank you, Nick, very much. Okay. Um, <clears throat> how's the audio, guys? I'm, I'm back to my, my good mic. I, I got rid of that awful Shure podcaster mic. It drove me nuts. I'm back to my, my 416. So tell me if the audio is okay. I think I've clipped a few times, but I'm trying not to do that. All right. Never fears getting constant buffering. I hope that's not me. Dan, maybe missed it. What are you drinking? Oh, um, well, I'm not sponsored. This is Heineken uh, Zero. Uh, I don't drink anymore. I used to, but I gave it up six months ago. And But I found that I actually kind of like, I used to hate this alcohol-free beer, all of it, because I thought it just did not do. But they're getting really good at reproducing. It's pretty close. It's not, really, it's not the real thing, but it's really close. Anyway, so yeah, it's I'm not sponsored. This is not. I shouldn't even be showing this label. <laughs> I just happen to be having this here. But yeah, gave up the booze six months ago. Now there's just the fake booze. All right. All right. Oh, bunch more. How are we doing on time here? We've been at this for some time. Um, 
I've been at this for longer than you guys because I had 15 minutes at the beginning of blackness where I was talking to nobody because I didn't hit the go live button <laughs> like an idiot. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> oh, my God. Janus Solo, 1994. Hi, Trevor. I'm a student of Lee Tokar. Oh, my old friend Lee from Vancouver. And I happened upon your channel while researching design for my own RPG. Turns out I had accidentally made a new Mythic GM emulator without knowing it. That happens all the time. First of all, welcome, Jaina. Uh, good to have you. Uh, say hello to Lee. I haven't seen him in a long time. He's one of the best. He's one of the greats. Um, I worked with Lee a lot in Vancouver in my voice days up there, and uh, he's he's super talented. He's we've had a we've had a lot of time, Lee and I. He's a great guy. Um, yeah, you know, accidentally making someone else's game happens all the time. Freaky, actually. Uh, there was a fella, and I will tell you this story because it would freak me out. <clears throat> months and months and months and months ago, I think it was November, when I first announced I was going to do my own system, I got an email from this fella who wanted to help. He wanted, he, he wanted to help me, which is great. But what he did was he, he, he basically gave me the guts of his RPG system that he had designed. And I didn't ask for that. But there it was. And it was freaky because a lot of the things that he had just happened to be very close to the game I had been designing for six months freaky but then when you think about it it's not that freaky he's been watching me he knows the kind of games i like hard master rune quest warhammer things like this so he knows that i the kind of mechanics i like he liked those kind of mechanics too when you're in a very small pool like gamers and when you're even in a smaller pool gamers who are like simulation side gamers and when you're even in a smaller pool of simulation side gamers who also design their own stuff there's only so many ways to build that mousetrap. There's only so many ways to design a system. So it's no surprise at all that someone came up completely by chance with something that was startlingly close to what I had been working on. But that's also why I can't accept unsolicited submissions from anybody because I, I can't take the risk of someone trying to claim that I stole their idea, you know? It just, it concurrently happens. It's called the zeitgeist. It happens all the time. Let me tell you a little story. This is not related to gaming at all, but it perfectly illustrates the point. This was 19... When was it? 99, maybe? I think it was when Matrix came out. I went to see The Matrix in a movie theater. 99, 98, whenever it was. <clears throat> and the scene in The Matrix where Keanu Reeves wakes up in the pod and he pulls the things out and you realize what's going on. You realize the whole thing is just a big, like, digital dream that they're trapped in. You know, you know, uh, spoiler alert for The Matrix. <laughs> but that scene, I kid you not, I stood up in the theater and went, oh, because one year before that, a very good friend of mine pitched me an idea for a screenplay, which was that exact thing. And I was like, oh my God, they stole Clinton's idea. It was crazy. It happens all the time. I was pitching scripts in Hollywood when I lived in LA. And it was amazing. I would pitch a script and people would go, well, yeah, we read something like that three months ago. And I thought I'd come up with this completely unique new thing. There's nothing new under the sun, my friends. And when you're talking about game design, there's only so many ways to build a mousetrap. And eventually you're going to wind up, quote unquote, stealing somebody's idea. But that's why you can't copyright game mechanics. You can't do it because it's part of the zeitgeist. You know, it just doesn't work that way. So anyway, don't send me unsolicited stuff. It put me in a very, very awkward situation where I, I didn't know how to respond to this. So please don't do that. Shake my fist, you kids. <laughs> Uh, Timothy, I enjoy a hard-fought win, and some of my best experiences have come from the losses. Yeah, man, because remember, <clears throat> and this is what my game tr strives to do as well, if you lose a conflict, it almost never means you're dead. It might, it might if you push it, and if you're, if you're doing the wrong thing, it might, but probably not. A loss involves you don't get what you want, and when your whole character, when your whole progression system is about trying to get what you want, that's a big deal. Much bigger than, oh, I lost another character to a goblin arrow. Guess I'll roll up a new one. That sucks. But it's also a risk you have to take. I do not believe in games where character death is off the table. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, 
I have if people want to play that way, it's perfectly fine. Enjoy, fill your boots, have a good time. But for me, if I'm in a game where there is physical conflict and death is not on the table, I have no interest in that game. Zero, because now there's no more tension. Because I know that I'm gonna I'm gonna survive all the time. I have to be able to lose. Otherwise, I don't wanna play. It's yeah. Anyway. Anyway, I'm really shaking my fist at the clouds today. Okay. <clears throat> Audio's good. Okay, good. Thank guys. Thank you very much. No buffering. No flipping. No flipping. You guys remember that? Larry Sanders. No flipping. No flipping. <laughs> Some of you may be not old enough for that. Although I doubt it. I have a feeling that most of the people on this stream are like my age or older. <laughs> I don't think we have a lot of Gen Zers here. Maybe we do, and if, if you're here, let me know. I'd be amazed if I had any really young young gamers here. That'd be awesome. That would give me great hope, but I suspect not. <laughs> the, you guys are all on TikTok, and uh, here I am doing a long form on YouTube. All right. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Classic Trevor, having as much fun by yourself as you do performing for your fans. Well, of course, if I can't enjoy myself for myself, what's the point of going on? <laughs> All right. All right. A oh, spoiler alert. Yeah. Spoiler, alert. spoiler alert for Matrix from 1999. Spoilers for Plato's Cave, says Larry G. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Because that's where it comes from. Yeah. Howdy from Germany, says Doom Hippie. Well, howdy, mein Freunde. It's good to have you here. Uh, where are we? <clears throat> Venting stuff that already exists, just like the professor from Gilligan's Island when he got back to civilization. Yes, yes. Uh, Lee Adamson, what is Mudcore? It says Trevor's Mudcore confirmed. What does that mean? I've never heard that term before. Is that some new frangled Gen Z thing? <sighs> like based or sick? <laughs> what is Mudcore? <laughs> uh, failure, says Bill N. Not give the PCs what they want. Give the PCs what they don't want. I think Sean T said that. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Gideon is 32. Okay, Gen Y is 32. Are you still millennial? I think you're still millennial technically. I don't care. It doesn't matter. Who cares? <laughs> it's irrelevant. But uh, a lot of people in their 30s. That's good. That's good. That's good. You're young enough. All right. Nope, says Jano36, only old men. <laughs> only old men really enjoying all of this, though. <laughs> oh, Alex. Alex Yeager. Look at this. Thanks for thanks for joining there, buddy. I uh, play with Alex. I'm good friends with his dad. And we, uh, uh, Alex was in my One Ring campaign, actually. In the latter half of it, he took over a character of a fellow who was no longer gaming with us because he was a dick. All right, uh, Kevin Peter. Hey, Trevor, have you decided on doing a Kickstarter for your rule system yet? I will definitely pledge if you do. Well, thank you for that. That is in talks. We're looking at that. That is a huge thing. Uh, I have a lot of help if I pull the trigger on that. Uh, I've never done it before. I'm not entirely convinced that I would have enough support from people. I'm not entirely convinced that enough people would know about it to actually make it successful. Um... That's another reason why I'm trying to get uh, the newsletter subscribers, though, right? Because if I do decide to announce something like that, it's so vital that I'm able to get enough people in the first day to say, yes, we will we will do this. Because that that's basically going to, you know, from what I understand, Kickstarter lives or dies on that. So, again, for those of you who just joined me, if you have not yet signed up for the newsletter, please do. Me, myself, and die.com slash newsletter <clears throat> and uh, totally free, costs you nothing. And I do not bombard you with emails at all. Um, but it, um, yeah, if I do decide to do it, uh, I will let you all know for sure. Because <laughs> I'll have to. Uh, Doug Bolden, channel member. I'm old enough to still have the orange dice from my first D&D &D box set. Oh, preach, brother. I'm, I got those too. I've got the old um, super, super, super light blue ones from the old uh, Moldve set where you, you had the white crayon. <clears throat> and you had to color in the, the numbers because otherwise you couldn't see them. Good stuff. I don't think I ever used those dice. I bought that set and I immediately bought another set of dice and I never used those cheap, cheap, cheap plastic light blue dice that came with the basic D&D &D set. Moldve? Is that right? Yes. Yes, Moldve. The sort of Errol Otis cover, the pink box. That was the first uh, first one I ever bought way back in 
80 or whatever it was. <clears throat> still have it. Still have it in the library. I think I should do a Sage's Library on that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> let's do the Sage's Library on good old basic D&D where it all started for me. Anyway. Okay. <clears throat> Timothy Gavin identifies a boomer. Oh, okay. A little older then. Not that much older, but older. 29. Lots of folks in your 20s and 30s. That's great. That actually gives me a lot of um, hope <laughs> for the future. Lee Adams and Mudcore is playing first edition AD&D Raw, dying every five minutes and re-rolling. Okay, well, that makes sense, Mudcore. It was originally meant as an insult, but I think it could be a fun way to play sometimes. It sure can. Um, DCC, I guess, would be Mudcore then. If you guys haven't played the DCC Funnel... Oh my God, it's such a blast. It is so much fun. Do it. <laughs> Run, don't walk. Get yourself a game of DCC and go through the funnel where you play the zero level characters. Oh my God, it's it's a blast. It's such a blast. Great game. <clears throat> All right. Lee Berg is an elder millennial, only started playing TTRPGs recently. Well, welcome to the, uh, welcome to the hobby. Uh, welcome... Lord Melkar. Every time someone calls me an old man for playing old school games, I remember that one line. Let me tell you the days of high adventure. Boom, 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 boom. Little Basil Polidorus coming at you to get me demonetized. <laughs> All right. Um, you boosted the signal for Kelsey. She would probably do the same for you. Well, here's open. I'm glad I can help her. I'll, I'll help. I'll help those people anytime I get a chance to. Okay. Chopsticks is 24. Again, great hope. Great hope. Great hope. Slump says, I remember rubbing the numbers in with a crayon. Yes. <laughs> so funny. So funny. Okay. Dragon Warriors. Captain Scarecrow. Scarecrow, one of my early games was Dragon Warriors. Dragon Warriors turned out to be a very big influence on my new game. Yes. Surprise! Surprise, surprise! Really neat things they do in that game. And there's one particular mechanic that shall remain unspoken that I went, oh, I gotta, I gotta use this. So, <clears throat> great stuff. It is definitely represented in my game. Uh, Gideon is taken off in the Netherlands. Gonna catch the rest tomorrow. Thank you for joining, uh, Gideon. Thanks for coming by. Um... <clears throat> Adam says uh, uh, you have a decent-sized millennial fan base based on these chats. Apparently so. That's great. You know, I, I check my YouTube uh, stats, and uh, mostly it shows that there's people sort of my age, but uh, that's great. That's great that um, there's some, some younger ones in there, which is good. Yes. <laughs> uh, Nataros, I'm 25. Is that Gen Z? Started watching you just before season two started. Having a blast since. Waiting for season four. Really like the idea of Simlight. Awesome. I am so pleased to hear that someone who's 25 is excited to hear about Simlight. That gives me hope. Because I believe that the Simlight system <clears throat> that I'm designing, that is, you know, inspired by a lot of other kind of Simlight games out there, I believe that that will open up a whole new world of gaming for you if you've only ever come from, like, D&D, Right? It's a whole other world of gaming. It's a whole other set of experiences. If I can provide that for you guys, if I can provide a game that opens your eyes to a different way of looking at things to give you a different angle on the gaming experience, then I'm a happy man. Then I've done my job because that's what it's all about. That would make me so happy. That'd just be so great. Uh, Doom Hippie. Tried DCC while running it. My players hated it. <laughs> well, yeah, that happens. <laughs> Uh, Ricardo, you said you named the Soul Cage because of your favorite Sting album. True. And I was listening to it last week. Good stuff. I liked every song on that album. So did I. <clears throat> Hugely influential to me, uh, that album. A lot of Sting's music is, actually. But especially that album. Hugely, hugely influential. Uh, Chopsticks, did you already talk about the focus character for season four? I did not, uh, because I'm not going to reveal that until season four begins. Um... Might be a surprise. <clears throat> Goldbeard Blacktooth, how did you hear about all of the games you have in your library? Lifetime, a lifetime of playing. I will tell you, <clears throat> excuse me, when I was young, the principal way that I found out about new games was 
Dragon Magazine and White Dwarf Magazine. White Dwarf especially. Because back then, when D&D was still being made by TSR, they, those magazines advertised everybody's stuff. White Dwarf used to advertise everybody's stuff. I found out about Call of Cthulhu through White Dwarf. I found out about Traveler through Dragon Magazine. There was a time of great camaraderie. There was a time in the 80s. You know, people talk about how RPGs are really in a golden age now, and they are. <clears throat> but it's not the first golden age. The first golden age, well, the first golden age was probably the 70s. But the golden age that I'm familiar with was the mid-80s, early to mid-80s. Back then, there was a game for everything, just like there is today. But the only way you found out about it, because there was no internet, the only way you found out about it was through conventions and through Dragon Magazine, White Dwarf Magazine. Years later, White Dwarf said, no more, we're only going to do Games Workshop-based stuff. And that's when I lost interest. Not that I'm not interested in Games Workshop stuff, but I was interested in, in so much more than just Games Workshop stuff. So I found out about stuff because of those magazines, those advertisements. <clears throat> when I discovered the advertisement in 1987, I think it was, 8, in Dragon Magazine, a four-page color spread for Warhammer Fantasy role-playing, first edition. And it was this beautiful, gothic, early Renaissance version of Germany with fantasy elm elements and horror elements that I realized this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. I'd never seen anything like it. Horror fantasy role-playing, not in a fantasy environment, in a Renaissance environment where medicine is just starting to come to its own, where the scientific method is just being hinted at. But, you know, to treat an insane person, you apply hot pokers to the skull to relieve the pressure. <laughs> right? Oh, my God. It was so great. So, so great. I, it became one of my favorite games of all time. Still is. And that was because of Dragon Magazine. So I still have so many of those old magazines in my library. There's another thing I should do with Sage's Library on, is go through these, some of the old magazines. And go through them and show you what it was like back then. Oh, good days. Good days. All right. Um, Wargamer, have you ever tried EZD6? If so, would you consider that sim light? No, I would consider that rules light. Very, very rules light. Um, sim, maybe I should explain what I mean by simulation light. <clears throat> um, and of course, this is my definition, right? Everyone has their own. That's That's been a long-running argument in gaming circles since the 70s, is what is you know, what is a, a gamist game or a simulation game, or there was all these terms that changed. Everybody talks about GNS theory as though Ron Edwards was the first one to come up with this. He was not. We were all talking about this stuff long before Ron Edwards ever came up with his brain damage theory of games. No. What I mean by simulation light is I like a system that provides a lot of details to take the narrative burden off of the, the players, and specifically the, G, the GM. So a system that provides a lot of detail to tell you exactly what happened when the dice hit the table. Not, I got hit for five hit points, but rather I got punctured in the left shoulder by a spear, and now it's bleeding out. That kind of thing. That simulation. To me. Now, there's also world simulation. World simulation is where you have something like Harn, where, <clears throat> not that you have to play Harn this way, but you certainly can play Harn this way, where you are you're exploring a, a richly detailed, very realistic feeling world, where the game is about existing in that world kind of day to day and living as those people would live. That's a, type, that's a kind of simulation too. But the simulation I'm talking about has to do more with what the mechanics give you. So if the mechanics give you um, <clears throat> something that is quote-unquote more realistic, then that's a simulation. But I want it sim light because the more detail you provide, the slower the engine's going to run. It's inevitable. So you want to find that perfect zone where you get enough detail, but you will still have pace and playability, right? That's what I, that's what I mean with sim light, and that's what my game is. And I think I found it. I think I found what is, for me, very close to the perfect blend of that. But we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, <clears throat> where are we here? 
The RPG I'm working on use, uses player choice driven predictions for combat outcomes, inspired by historical duels, neat, rather than dice or cards. It's so tricky to balance, but I think it'll be really cool. Yeah, um, I'm big on randomizers, but uh, anything like that can be cool, especially when you're talking about duels. Like if you're talking about classic like rapier duels, there's so many ways. If you look at, there was a game way back in the day <clears throat> called Flashing Blades, which was entirely about mechanics for emulating those kind of duels, or there's a game now called, oh boy, it's at the tip of my brain. It's it's basically you play musketeers in that time period, and it has very detailed dual mechanics where you have the advantage on someone, and basically if you've got the advantage on them, they're sort of on the back foot, and then the next phase of that is they're sort of on their knees, and the next phase is you've got your blade to their throat, and I can't remember what it's called. Maybe someone can help me with this, <clears throat> but... Uh, yeah, any of those kind of games where there's really specific duels and things like that, uh, those kind of those mechanics are, are, are neat. Uh, and I have something akin to that in my combat system. There's a lot of choice in the combat system that the that the combatants have. If they are successful in their role against their opponent, they decide how they want to apply their successes. Right? It, it's it's not it's the opposite of a lot of games where you say, "Well, I'm going to try and disarm him." The GM says, "Okay, well, roll minus twenty then." At which point the player says, oh, to hell with it, I'll just hit him. My game's not that. My game is you roll, it's kind of like Mithras that way. You roll, and then after the roll, and depending on what the opponent did, you decide what to do with the level of success that you've, you've, you've achieved. And then things happen, right? So it's a, little, it's a little backwards in some ways. But once you get used to it, once you internalize it, it works very, very quickly. And it's very satisfying because it gives the players a tremendous amount of choice. And I am all about giving players meaningful choice every step of the way. It's huge for me. <clears throat> all right. All right. All right. Dragon Magazine was so awesome. Yes, it was. Uh, Nataro says, when you say Simlight, I imagine an easier Dominion or Mithras. Yeah, basically. That's right. Um, Dominion is not particularly difficult, but it can get hiccupy at times, as even I found in Season 3. Mithras, I'm a big fan of Mithras, but for me, Mithras is just too far down the simulation road. Mithras has just too many niggly rules that I am guaranteed to forget. I'm the guy that always forgets the stim pack, for those of you who've watched uh, Five uh, Parsecs from Home, <laughs> my series. So <clears throat> if there's too many little niggly details in a combat where I'm playing solo... It's just an invitation for me to forget it. <laughs> it's just an invitation for me to forget the rules. So my goal is to give myself the same, the same level of choice and detail without having to remember a whole bunch of math or remember a bunch of finicky rules. That's my design intention. And as I said, I think I've done it. <laughs> but we'll see. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Where are we here? How are we doing for time? I've been I've been gabbing for a long time here. I think we're at like an hour and a half or something. But if you guys want me to keep going, I will. I've got this lovely fake beer I keep that's gradually getting warmer. You let me know if you want me to keep going <clears throat> or if you're bored of my blather and I will wrap it up. Uh, where are we here? Where are we here? <clears throat> I think I've caught up to most of the uh, questions now. Uh, Adam Casino says, uh, Game Informer magazine was that for us millennials, but for video games. I loved seeing games previewed or reviewed and then uh, running to buy the game. Yeah, I guess that's a similar uh, experience. Um, same same feeling. <laughs> same feeling. Third Duck asks, hey, have you, Trevor, have you played Baldur's Gate 3? I have not. Uh, haven't had time, but everybody tells me how great it is. I'm a huge fan of Baldur's Gate, the first one and the second one. They were, for those of you who don't remember or were too young to remember, Baldur's Gate was transformative. That game changed video games forever. It, it basically created the, what we now think of modern-day fantasy RPG, computer RPGs. It was transformative. It is so, so goddamn good. So good. So no, I haven't, but I will eventually, I'm sure, you know, when it's 10 bucks. <laughs> Kevin has a huge collection of Dragon and Dungeons and oh Dungeons too. Yeah, that was the adventure. I, I had the very first dungeon magazine with the with the red dragon on the cover. I still have it. I will do a Sage's library on that. I have to. That's gonna be so fun. Maybe I'll shoot that tomorrow. <clears throat> okay. Uh no, Magnificent Devil, it's not all for one. It's called Oh my god. I can't believe I'm forgetting this. I could look it up, I guess, but I just can't be bothered. 
All right, all right, all right. Wargamer says, thank you for the explanation. I will look forward to your system, which you will release, as he waves his Jedi hand. <laughs> all right. Um, <clears throat> Timothy Gavin says, sounds like I'm going to love it. I forget lots of things. Yeah. It's my bane. I try and get the rules right every episode I do, and I've never once achieved that. I always screw something up. And I just have to accept that that's because I'm one brain trying to do too much <laughs> at once. And that's part of the charm. You know, what are you going to do? I, I uh, Something goes wrong at some point. And I look back and I think, all right, so what? Okay, yeah, he should have had an extra attack here. Would it have changed the outcome? Maybe. But he didn't. So it didn't happen. Move on, right? <laughs> it's the only way you can do it. The only way you can do it. Uh... <clears throat> Even if it takes another whole year and season five of playtesting, it shall be worth it. Well, we'll see. I, I thank you for your um, your uh, confidence. All right. Uh, M. Khan says, did you mention any new random table supplements you're planning to use for this season? I talked about that earlier. <clears throat> uh, I will not be creating my own stuff. I'll be using other people's because they've done it better. Joshua Benes, what's your favorite video game? Ah... Uh, there's been some real great ones. Obviously, Baldur's Gate, as I just said. <clears throat> Witcher 3 is one of the best experiences I've ever played, for sure. Obviously, um, Oblivion, Skyrim, that kind of stuff. Um, they're great. All right. Kevin Peter says, no, keep going. I'm drinking real beer, having a great time. Well, okay, <laughs> cheers. <laughs> hmm. All right. Yeah, they really do a good job. That's That's pretty close to the real thing, I have to say. More or less Tori. Oh, here we go. <clears throat> What's the hardest accent you had to do, and were you mad you introduced the character because you had to keep doing the accent? On the show? Um, I don't think I was ever mad that I introduced an accent, but uh, uh, Aero Nicola, who was the captain of the ghoul, the drunken ghoul, <clears throat> when I started, when he showed up, and he showed up very, very early in, I think maybe episode two or three, he showed up in season three. He just had one of those northern accents like that. And as soon as I did it, I thought, uh-oh, this is not one I've ever done before, so I'm going to have to see if I can launch right into it because uh, I don't want to have to redo a bunch of lines because I've got the bloody accent wrong. Uh, so I was scared. I was scared of that one. And then it seemed to work okay. And then I got used to it. I was like, okay, that's okay. But I was scared of it at the beginning because I'm like, ooh, I, I, don't, I don't really do a lot of northern English accents, but <clears throat> I guess I do now, so that's all right. <laughs> all right. I would love to introduce, and maybe I will, I would love to introduce a Johannesburg accent in season four, and maybe I will. Johannesburg. I will tell you a quick story <clears throat> about that accent. My whole career as a voice actor... The South African accent was often considered like the holy grail of accents because it's a very, very odd one to do for a North American. Um, there's aspects of so many different areas <clears throat> and accents in that one. And it was always the holy grail. Like we could never quite get it. And then one day when I was in L.A., I was living in L.A., working in L.A., I was working on Guardians of the Galaxy at the time. I played Rocket Raccoon. And uh, I was doing, I was at home, in my apartment, and I was doing the laundry. And I was hanging the the shirts that needed to be hung that I didn't put in the dryer. And as I was hanging <laughs> the laundry, I found myself talking to the laundry in a Joburg accent. And I didn't even realize I was doing it. I was talking to the wash, right? I was doing this. Okay, we're going to put you up here. Right, I'm going to put you on this uh, little hanger here. You're going to stay there. No, see, I screwed it up already. But I started to talk like I was South African, right? Like uh, like I was somebody from uh, District 9. You remember that movie about the aliens? The, the prawns, the pop, like little popcorns? So I started to do that. Just because. And I, I suddenly went, oh my God, I I think I'm I'm doing the South African accent. So I went to session that day. And we were recording Guardians of the Galaxy, the animated series. And, and at the break... <laughs> At the break, uh, I was kind of messing around and I, I was saying, oh my God, right, this is amazing. I was talking to my laundry, I was hanging the wash and all of a sudden, this Joburg guy came out like this. And one of the producers looked at me and went, 
you can do that accent? I said, I, I, I couldn't this morning, but <laughs> apparently by some magic, it has descended from on high upon me. And he went, oh, a couple days later, I'm in another session for Avengers and I'm playing some bad guy, Ares or somebody. And I only had a, I only had a couple lines. So I'm doing my lines and I'm finished and then they're going to let me go. So they say, okay, Trevor, you're wrapped. Okay, so I'm about to leave. And then the, the director says, actually, hold on, Trevor, come back. So I came back. Colette was her name. And I could see that same producer, Harrison. Uh, he was beside her and he was saying something to her. And she said, um, can we get you to do that last line again, but this time in a South African accent? I was like, what? Okay, so I, I did it right. Like this, whatever the line was, I forget. But I did it and it's okay, thanks. Uh, so I get home and I have this call from my agent going, well, you've been cast as Claw. <laughs> that was the audition. I just happened to be playing around with that accent. And the the right person heard it and went, by total coincidence, they were looking to cast Claw, who was Black Panther's nemesis. And they went, oh, well, I guess Trevor's the guy. <laughs> so I that's probably my favorite Hollywood story ever. <laughs> <laughs> of all the years I worked in Hollywood, that's probably my favorite one. Just being cast because I was screwing around with uh, <laughs> with an accent. So it's funny. Anyway, that all right. Back to game. <laughs> back to game. Back to game. Uh, where are we here? Flashing blades. Thank you, Jaina. That's the one. No, that's not the one. That's the one I. <laughs> that's the one I referenced. The one I'm thinking of is called. Oh my God! I can see it. You know, I'm going to have to look it up. I have to look it up. This is driving me mental. Uh, where are we? Where are we? Look up my gargantuan game library. Where is it? It's called Pa. Pa? P? Pu? P? Per? P? No? Eh? Flavin? Oh, don't tell me. I don't actually have a copy of it in this folder. <clears throat> oh, my God. Come on. What's it called? Mm, nope, nope, I'm not seeing it. It is not working today, so can't remember. Honor and Intrigue! That's the one. Honor and Intrigue. That's the one I'm thinking of. Not Pa. There's no Pa. No Pa. No Pa. <laughs> Honor and Intrigue. That's what I'm talking about. It's a real Musketeers kind of historical France kind of game. Uh, lots of really cool dueling. <clears throat> Um, it's based on Barbarians of Lemuria, which is a very rules light game. Uh, but this takes that engine and basically extrapolates it into a different setting and with slightly different um, rules and all that good stuff. Oh, Doom Hippie, 4 a.m. in Germany. Yeah, get some shut eye, my friend. Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. Have a, have a, and may angels sing you to your final rest or something ominous <laughs> like that. Uh, okay. Ricardo, does it bother you when people make fun of mozzarella because his name sounds like mozzarella? Yes. Yes, it does. It pisses me off because that name was purely random in the moment. And in the moment, I was in the moment and it sounded cool. And so I went with it. If I could go back and do it over, I have like five other names that are way cooler sounding. I may rename him, but I doubt it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm committed. I'm committed to that. But as soon as people pointed that out, I was like, oh, of course it sounds like that. But I'm not going to respond to that stuff because that really pisses me off. Because it's like, I'm in this moment trying to create something cool. And people are like very juvenilely going, <laughs> John McMatterella. Okay, what are you, two? Are you two? So yes, it bothers me. And I'm, no, I'm never going to talk about it again. <laughs> but thanks for asking. <laughs> Adam Casino. I kid, Ricardo. I kid. Sometimes people take me too seriously. Uh, do you play board games? So many board games now are solo. That is true. And a ton are now narrative-based RPG to box. Yeah, there's so many now, aren't there? I do. I've got my, my guys here where I live now. They're big board gamers, so we play a lot. Of, they've introduced me to a ton. I'm, I wasn't a huge board game guy before, but uh, I used to play Axes and Allies by myself as a kid. I would call it a self game where I just, I would, Play the game exactly as normal, except that I played all of them. And you'd think, well, how do you do that? Well, I was able to refocus my mind. It starts with uh, Russia. You start with Soviet Union in that game. And I would, and I would be like, okay, what are they going to do? They're going to do this. They're going to commit to this. And then the dice are going to tell the story. And then you switch to Germany. Okay, new hat. Now, what are they going to do? 
and you would play, or I would play, uh, exactly to the intentions of that player, of, of that country. I wouldn't cheat myself. I didn't have, I could have, but I didn't want any one particular person to win. I just let the dice decide. So I guess I was an early solo role player in like the early 80s, and I didn't even know it. Who knew? Who knew? Uh, Friss, 13. So what was your incentive to create your own game? Now that is a good question. And there have been many good questions. What was my incentive to create my own game? Um, I love so many different games. And I love so many different pieces of all those games. <clears throat> I wanted to see if I could make all of those pieces work together. Um, which I thought would be impossible. I thought, that's a fool's errand. It, that, that's crazy. And I was right. It is crazy. All of the things that I wanted to put into my game couldn't work together. But some did. And enough did to make it worth the effort. But there were some things, take Harn Master. For those of you who know Harn Master, the concept of the different wound levels and the concept of each piece of armor giving protection based on whether it's slashing uh, blunt or puncture damage and all of that stuff. I love that stuff, but I couldn't make that fit in my game. And I left it out because I couldn't make it fit. But more importantly, I knew it was too much of sim light, not full sim. That's full sim, sim light. And I knew I was going to do this on the channel. <clears throat> so I needed it to move a little faster than that. I love Harn Master, but it's just not right for that. So I couldn't, I couldn't put all of those square pegs in round holes. Some things I knew. I tried. Okay, I really like this thing from this game. You know what? It doesn't really, it doesn't really work. Okay, that's fine. You know. But still, again, like I've said, the game is easily uh, at least 15 different games. You can see clearly the DNA. Clearly. And, uh, you know, like a friend of mine, Navi, says, only you could do this, dude. He, he, only you could take all of these games that you've played. Because most people don't. Most people play one or two or three games, and that's it. That's what they focus on. I, I played all of them and ran all of them extensively. So I know them all very well. And I have the time and inclination to take them apart and put them back together and in a Frankenstein beast. It's alive! And to have an audience big enough that actually wants to see it in action. Only I could do that. As far as I know. That's what he says. And I think, oh, maybe that's true. And if that is true, then I, found I, can't, I kind of feel like I have an obligation to do it. Because as I've said many times, I want to open people's eyes to new ways of playing games, right? Not better, just new. New is good. You know, throw a fresh coat of paint on something. But good question, Fritz. Thank you for that. Um, all right. <clears throat> all right. Joshua says, the problem with watching this is that I've bookmarked so many dang games to check out and try. Yeah, welcome to my sickness, my friend. Welcome to my sickness. All right. Um, <clears throat> Caitlin, how do you think your new system will help you in the filming and producing side of the episodes? I, I hope it doesn't get in the way. <laughs> That's my big hope. Uh, I will say this, actually. This brings up a really good thing. So thank you for that question, Caitlin. I will say this. The game has demanded a new dice tray. A very special kind of dice tray. And that dice tray, you will see it. Um... It was designed, hand-designed, specifically for Season 4 and specifically for my system. So I might release that as a merchandise item or if we, in fact, do a Kickstarter, I might make that as like an add-on goal or, or stretch goal, whatever, to be able to produce that because there's only one right now. We just made it for the show. But it's pretty cool. And a lot of, a lot of people ask me about dice trays all the time. And I thought, well, the, the dice tray I use on the, on the show now is not very good. It's, it's, it's not deep enough. And so most of the time, dice would just pop out of the dice tray, and it kind of sucks. This one is not. This one is a proper dice tray. Um, so we'll see. Uh, we'll see if, if you guys are interested in that. Or, like I said, if I do a Kickstarter thing, you know, it will be out there at some point, I'm sure. Um, but, yeah, uh, so that's a thing. All right, Mr. Troy says, your favorite is Carlos, right? My favorite what? My favorite awful, awful character? <laughs> You gotta love Carlos. Or not. I don't know. 
Um, Morta says, are you excited for the Savage World Sci-Fi Companion? Well, I already have it from the previous edition. So I don't know what they've changed, but uh, I haven't played the new Savage World. I have it. Uh, they sent it to me. So thanks for that, guys. Um, uh, but I haven't played it. So I don't know when I'm going to get back to Savage Worlds. Uh, I do love Savage Worlds. <clears throat> um, so no, I guess I'm not excited about it. I didn't even know it was, there was a new version coming out. But good. I'm glad there is. Okay, uh, Stephen says, thanks for all your hard work. It's been a huge inspiration. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Captain Scarecrow, your Aussie NPC in Season 2 is so good. Yeah, he was pretty crazy, right? That guy, that crazy druid. Okay, that guy, <laughs> right out of a right out of a fucking Mad Max movie. Right out of the desert. <laughs> all right. Uh, Paul C., any chance of non-human races in Season 4? 100% chance of that. Uh, 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 Caitlin, when you get an exceptional yes on can you do a South African accent? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. Exactly. Yes, and then Honor and Intrigue based on uh, uh, Barbarians of Lemuria. So there we have awesome. Okay. Uh, how are we doing here? Larry, a lot of names sound like other things or mean certain things in other languages. At some point, you just have to stop worrying and go with what sounds good to you. Yep, exactly right. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Nataros, I need tips for solo gaming. How about watching me myself and die? I hear that guy knows a thing or two. Uh, I can't play systems I like with oracles because I don't really believe in it. But when it's Iron Sworn or 5 bar 6 from home, I can move forward a lot. I'm broken. I don't know if I understand you. You don't believe in the oracles? Because if you if you like Iron Sworn, then you like Oracles. Because that's that's all Iron Sworn does is use Oracles. So I'm curious. I'm, I'm not sure if I quite understand your position on that. Perhaps you could explain. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, Chris Smith. Wow, solo playing before it was a thing. I guess so. Who knew? Who knew? Um, uh, Eric Downing is the magic system in your game inspired from Mars Magic in part. Oh yeah, definitely. Not solely, but. Uh, that's a big influence. When I first saw Ars Magica, I thought, this is the greatest magic system I have ever seen. Um, it, it, it blew my mind. Because, and this is the thing that I, this is the philosophy I take from Ars Magica in my own game. If magic is formulaic, then it's no longer magic. Now it's science. Now it's just another weapon. Now it's just another fireball does all the same thing. Magic Missile always does this. That's so boring to me. That's, there's nothing magical about that magic. Nothing. There's also nothing magical about treating magic like just another expendable resource that you fire off your spells and then you go to sleep and the next day you wake up and you memorize different ones. I'm bored just talking about it. I know why it exists and I know why the early <clears throat> creators of D&D did it that way. But it's been a long time since 1973 uh, or 74. So there's so many more interesting ways to do magic. And when I saw Ars Magica, I was like, this is fantastic. Now, I saw the third edition, which was still when it was published by White Wolf. And that, that was the first edition. I still have that one. Um, I love that one. I loved it. I loved the presentation. It was really broken in many ways, but boy, just great presentation. And it inspired me hugely. So yeah, my, my magic system is very... You can definitely see the DNA of Ars Magic in my game. Uh, that said, it's also a lot more risky in my game than it is in Ars Magica. Um, yeah, you're, it's kind of the nuclear option magic in my game, but <clears throat> you'll see how it works uh, at some point. Uh, okay, Magnificent Devil. George Lucas called his squid race <laughs> Mon Calamari, yes, and named a language Bocce. I wouldn't worry about a name that sounds like another word for cheese. Yeah, yeah, I know, but I do. <laughs> Invoke often. I'd like to see you do a solo campaign set in Lankmar. I ran a great Palladium game. I know you were supposed to say Palladium, but to me it'll always be Palladium. Set in Lankmar, except it wasn't called Lankmar. I just used the Lankmar supplement for AD&D. And I uh, set it in my own Viking kind of world. It was called the Miklagard, which was just the Vikings term for uh, Constantinople. Um, 
but uh, it was fantastic. That supplement was so cool. So cool. Love it, love it, love it. All right. All right. All right. Ricardo, ah, oh, I get it when some people want their game to be serious, but to me, the best experience I've ever had playing were players making fun of each other. So, okay, I'll stop making fun of Maltzeroth. You don't have to. You don't have to. Um, <clears throat> uh, Lee Adamson, I love full sim for a solo play. You don't have a bunch of other players sitting around getting bored when things are slow. Yeah, that's true. And then there's the other side of that too, right? Where a lot of solo players, um, kind of including myself, don't want to play something super simulationist by yourself because it it still just takes a long time. I find for me, like especially Har Harn Master is kind of my gold standard for simulationist stuff. Uh, I really enjoy the back and forth with the players and all the complexity that arises from having multiple players. Um, which I just, I don't quite get the same satisfaction if I'm doing it by myself. Although I haven't really ever solo role played properly in Harn Master, so I can't really say uh, that for sure. Uh, Dan Webb says, show a few more thumbs up, folks. Yeah, come on, guys. There's only 143 likes, but of course there's 138 viewers, so I guess that's pretty good. <laughs> Uh, RV, you had said you wished you knew about Pirate Borg sooner. Any plans to try that again someday? Maybe. Uh, that's an example of a rules light game that is looks so much fun. It would be great for a couple sessions. So maybe. Maybe, maybe. All right. Skinny Jean is taking off in the UK. Good night. Good night. Lots of lots of good comments tonight here, guys. Um. Science Fantasy, awesome. Missed most of it, but wanted to pop in and say hi and say thanks for all. So thank you. Uh, check out the stream. It'll still be up. You can go and uh, see what you missed. <clears throat> all right. Oh, Netaros, answering my question. What I mean with not believing is that I don't feel engaged in the story when I choose a system and add an oracle, but when I use a complete system that carries me forward, I just click and engage. That's interesting. I don't really see a difference for myself. I, I, I understand that you do see a difference, but for me, I don't really see a difference in that because to me, the oracle is just a... It just provides the role of a GM, like in a real game, in a real game, in a, <laughs> in a normal game, not even that, in, in a b b game with many players, in a GM, in a traditional game, that's the word, traditional game. <laughs> um, yeah, so for me, I don't really see a difference in that. It's just It's just another way of providing all the things that a GM would provide, but every, each to his own, each to his own. Okay, um, it is time to go. But first, Yan, new member. We'll see how long you remember, Yan. I think you were you were a patron once, weren't you, Yan? I can't remember. I think you've been around a long time, though. Is the Force in Star Wars considered like magic to you? Um, I'm not sure I understand that question. Are you talking mechanically? Would it, like, if I was... Would I consider it magic? I would probably... Treat the mechanics like I would treat magic. Yeah. Uh, you'll see uh, You'll see my system in action. Uh, the magic system. At least parts of it. And you'll get a better idea. So, make sure you do check out uh, Season 1 when it comes out, which will be, we hope, in a couple weeks. I am going to take off now. We've been ranting a lot for a long time now. And um, thank you. Thank you all. Please do sign up for the newsletter. Please do consider joining the YouTube channel subscriber membership, the membership, or over on Patreon. Uh, all of that helps keep the, the, the channel going. And uh, and I, I really do thank all of you for joining me. I think this is the most people I've ever had. And that's pretty good because I'm just a little channel. I'm just, in the end, a very small person in a much larger world. So thanks, guys. And uh, I will do another one of these. Um soon because it's fun it's fun uh, and thank all of you uh before for your generosity and your tips and your thoughts for my friend in the hospital as well um i will i will um i will give an update as to what's going on with that and uh and let you know anyway okay i'm gonna go now thanks guys and i will talk to you soon okay bye <laughs>